Welcome, Welcome to Script Camp's class on exposition. In today's class, we'll be going over some principles of communicating key information in your story, and we'll have some time to share your work and your scenes that you feel you might want to work on improving your exposition in those scenes, or maybe just answering questions that you have, um, issues that are related to exposition in your own work that you'll have time to take. Uh, raise, raise hands today, today and um, you, you should be able to weigh in and share your projects with us. With us. Let's, Let's get started, started on just this overview. So this will be a, a pretty uh, quick slideshow portion, portion, but we're, we're going to go over the basics. basics. So first, first of all, just what is exposition and how exactly does it work? Why is it considered bad? And, and obviously it's not really bad. It's communicating information is really key to do in all stories. But, but why does it have this kind of connotation of, oh no, too much exposition. We don't want to feel the exposition. We need, we need the exposition, but we don't want it. It's like the medicine that you have to take. It's the sugar that you take before the meatloaf or whatever it is. So, so yeah, yeah, we have to have it, and all scripts have it in some format or another. Exposition is not a purely bad thing, so we'll look at just why is it considered that way and how to avoid some of those common problems. We'll talk about just some of these basic terms, like made in Butler, put in the pool, just sort of very general, very common writing advice. Um, the, some, some principles that will help us move past clunky and ineffective exposition, such as just the relevant info. And I want to, I don't actually have a Garth Minix clip per se, I have a clip from a different book, I have a clip from Nestor's by Siobhan Carroll, which we can look at and sort of assess how she's so effortlessly able to give us a lot of exposition in just one single paragraph. Um, and we'll have some time to talk about voiceover as well, which I have a lot of thoughts on, and I'm generally just a really big fan of voiceover. Okay, okay. Um, so, so as, as the class goes on, you can use the text chat, meaning click, click that, that whiteboard bubble over the classroom, classroom channel to open up the chat on the right-hand side of your Discord window. window. Or, if or if you're, you're watching this on one of our other platforms, like YouTube, YouTube Twitch, Twitter, Facebook, then um, you can comment there, and we should be able to see it in, within like a couple minutes of you posting it, or you can come join us on Discord, where we have classes like this. Uh, at least a like hundred hours of events, classes, and workshops a month, with more being added all the time. All right, um, let's get into our slideshow for today. I think I'm not going to do this just opening discussion slide. Tell us some bits of exposition or scenes you struggle with in, the proje in other projects. Let's just talk about the basics of what this is first before we get into discussion. So let's start on just exposition. So what is this? This is we are exposing information in a story. So uh, this is kind of often used in the context of information that the audience needs to know to fully understand the story. Is it exposition if your character just tells us what they have for breakfast? Well, maybe not necessarily, because that's not key information. And it's going to really matter for that plot and be an essential part of that plot moving forward. So exposition often, it kind of really shows itself and becomes very clear when it's not done well, when it's done in a very kind of obtuse, clunky, obvious way. When, when we feel the exposition, I know I was kind of making fun of this idea earlier, but it's sort of true. We shouldn't feel it happening. It should feel like just a... Um, it, should, it, should, it should almost go unnoticed in a way. Like, like we are logging the information, but often a nice way to handle this is something else important, important is happening in that same scene. Or it could be that the, uh, that the expositional information is kind of couched in something else or hidden in something else. Or we are able to sort of explore what that information means in an active way rather than having Spider-Man just sit in a, at a desk and have somebody explain what all his powers are. If we can see him playing around with and using his different powers, that is also a form of exposition. Like exposition is just conveying information to the audience. It doesn't mean that it has to just come from people talking and telling us stuff. Showing instead of telling, telling is very trite, ancient writing advice, advice but, but it's, it's very, very true because we, it's, it's like a very applicable idea because we can, can learn quite a bit without having to have things told to us. Um, there, there are subtle and interesting and fun ways to tell things to the audience, audience and there, there are times that we can and should tell things. But for the most part, we like to kind of feel like we're living in the moment with the characters and we don't want them to be repeating things to each other that they should already know or things that are already really common knowledge in their profession and I think we've all seen these really, really bad, clunky, clunky examples of a doctor, uh, as you know, as a cancer doctor, you do realize this is a tumor, right? Or a doctor, as a, uh, as a blood specialist, you do realize that this uh, is a negative type blood, which means, and it's like, yeah, he knows what that means. You don't need to explain to a blood doctor what different blood types are. And it starts to really show itself, like the hand of the author, as we sometimes say, becomes really clear when you feel the need to kind of have characters step out of their normal natural experience and sort of explain things in a way that seems like it's just for the audience's benefit. That is what we call clunky exposition. We can see here this guy, uh, this awesome Powers character, Basil Exposition. He's a funny way of kind of 
you know, lampshading this idea of the exposition dump in the movie. He shows up, he's like, I'm the exposition guy. Here's all the info you need to know, Austin Powers. And he sort of takes that role and manages to make it funny and sort of, just, again, we're adding sugar to the medicine or whatever. He disguises the information by just dressing it up and kind of putting a clown suit on it and saying, okay, well, here's all the stuff you have to know. And it's done in a goofy way that fits in the tone of that story and also distracts us just from that medicine of the, the information. Um, we might need exposition to kind of understand a character, the world and its rules. Um, I think we've all seen a sci-fi movie where somebody starts folding a piece of notebook paper and sticks a pencil through it and tells us that's how wormholes work. I think you have to have that scene in any movie with a wormhole. Um, but uh, you can see that that's just a nice way of illustrating that premise a lot of the time, assuming that space-time can be folded and we're moving through it like that. I will say one of the early versions of that exposition scene came from the original Wrinkle in Time novel by Madeline Lingle, which has like an illustration of somebody scrunching up a cloth. And, 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 and it's sort of that same thing that they use in every time travel or space travel movie where they fold it up and stick a thing through it. But the, the first time I saw it was in a novel from the 60s or 70s, right? So I thought that was kind of cool. Anyway, so we might need just information to understand the events and the plot and who the different roles and the characters are and what their dynamics are. I think we all have seen this really bad, really egregious one for that I can never forgive. Hey, bro, what's up, sis? Who, who talks to their siblings like that? I mean, I understand in some limited circumstances, maybe some people have some inside joke or some nickname like that, but um, having characters announce their relationship to each other makes it feel like a kind of bad improv sketch. We don't want to have your characters step outside of their own experience and try to make it feel like they're just delivering information to the audience. Um, so uh, this whole, how long have we known each other kind of line, or... You know, you know, as, as you know, know, dot, 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 dot. Well, well, if, if we, we both know it, we often don't need to say it. Exposition is often considered, quote, bad, or it's portrayed. Sorry, you guys are hearing this howling dog in the room. That's a chihuahua and two pups just freaking out. out. Um, so, so exposition has this negative connotation mostly just because we only, pe most people only notice it when it's a problem. This is dog thinks it's a problem, doesn't he? This is so loud. Um, so, uh, where, where was I going with this? Um, we only really notice this, it, most people only notice this if it's really obvious. Most audience members won't even identify something as exposition if it's done really well. They'll be like, no, that's just the characters living their lives, right? So, you don't want to draw too much attention to it or make the audience roll their eyes. You don't want them to get bored or get annoyed. And a lot of writers give the sense that they don't believe the viewer can piece together information or kind of pick up on relationships without over-explaining things in a way that's just not entertaining to watch. I think a lot of the time, a, a, a better, better alternative to the whole hey bro, hey sis kind of thing is have your character mention something, something in relation to mom or dad, dad right? And, and, and that's, that's also a, a, a way that a lot of shows kind of handle this that's really elegant. It shows that the people are related and it feels really natural and real because people would just refer to mom and dad and assume the other person knows exactly who you mean and they have the same mom or dad, so the terminology we're going to use is going to be shared between them. We don't, we don't always need to know people's exact dynamic or relationship in the very first scene where we see them either. You can wait a little while. We can pick it up. We can piece it together. We can kind of gather who they are. But sometimes you'll even see, sometimes a producer or somebody will get nervous and there will be a scene in a movie or show where there will be an eight-yard line added in after the fact where the character's like, uh, and, and anyway, sis, we gotta go. Like, they just feel like we don't like to not know characters' relationships for too long. It's really, really not, not that huge a deal. We can often figure it out, and sometimes we can even use that ambiguity to our advantage in the story sense. We have a question in the chat. Is this the second class? No, this is a one-off class. You are, this is a standalone. Yep. <laughs> okay, um, let's go into bad exposition. So we talked about this thing. Hey, bro, hey, sis, how long have we known each other? Our whole lives. Um, so the dialogue is telling the audience something that the characters already know or clearly should already know. It's going to be one of these big, kind of clumsy ways to do this. Characters talking about pivotal events or information rather than the writer kind of showing these things through the live narrative. I mentioned you know, how boring it would be if Spider-Man sits down and just goes through a checklist of all the cool powers that he'll have instead of just flailing around and trying to swing on a web and seeing what happens. Does he fall down? Does he manage? Does he miss with the web? Does he cling to the wall? We can maybe see him discover some new powers he didn't know that he had. You can make all these scenes really kind of as active and interesting as possible by showing the character. Like, movies are about people doing stuff. So you should have the characters out there trying things out, 
running, running into, into the, you know, experiencing, experiencing the consequences of failure and of experimentation with different rules of their world. There's all, all kinds of ways that we can avoid just sitting in the audience down and feeling like, like we're about, about to give them a class or a lecture on a principle. So, so try not to use these super detailed texts that appears on screen to, to, to over-summarize backstory and plot elements. Um, I mean, I mean at, at the beginning and at the end of your movie, you feel you have a little bit of license to use text cards, especially if there's some historical science fiction or fantasy context to the events that we're about to see. You get, get like a couple paragraphs if you really, really insist. It's, it's uncommon nowadays to do the big Star Wars opening crawl, but I mean, if you have just a paragraph that says, you know, the Roman Empire is burning. You know, you know, just gives, gives us like a sense, sense of when and where we are, what is going on generally in the world. But in a few sentences, you can sum it up. You are entitled to that if you need it. If, if you don't need it, it's going to seem silly that you included it. Um, TV and radio brought newscasts that shared detailed information about plot events. I think we all may have seen this sometime too. Oh gosh, I heard, I heard there was a bank robbery today to turn on the news. So, so earlier this evening, there was a bank robbery downtown at the American Bank. Or what is it? Bank of America. Um, so, so we've, we've all seen the character turns on the radio or the TV at just the right time, and they just get the relevant part of the story. It happens to be exactly the thing that they were wondering about or that is relevant to them. Um, obviously, this doesn't really happen in real life. Sometimes you have to dig a little bit to get to a new story that you're looking for, or sometimes it hasn't been reported on yet, or any number of things. But we should just avoid. Having these really convenient technology dumps, characters just Google something. I, I, my version of this that I am particularly sensitive to as mostly a horror thriller writer is every time we kind of Google the ghosts and your characters are like, oh, this must be a chupacabra. Hang on. They just whip out their computers and they just Google it and they find out, oh, okay, a chupacabra is vulnerable to sunlight and it eats sheep, but only after 8 p.m. They get all the rules and all the info that they need to know in the least interesting and least fun way when... The research, research sequences can, can be a blast if you know how to do them, right? I mean, I mean look, look at sort of Lovecraftian media, where in the Lovecraft, Lovecraft stories, a visit to the library is not only an opportunity for your character to find out the information they need to know, find out stuff that they didn't intend to know, maybe digging a little too deep into the secrets that they're discovering and finding out stuff that threatens their lives or their sanity, but also it's a good place for your characters to be stalked or attacked or to have a clandestine meeting or to have some other kind of objective at the same time where your characters need to break into the library and need to be very quiet in their research. All these things just allow us to do more than one, accomplish more than one goal in the same scene, and then almost always that's going to be the best kind of bandage or band-aid for this problem of the exposition scenes is if it's too obvious. It seems like it's too surface level. Um, so we have a question, turning on TV and providing info isn't okay. Um, uh, at times it makes sense, and if your character, for instance, is, um, you know, they really actively search for the information that they're looking for. Maybe they can find it on TV or on the internet or something like that. It, there are contexts in which it makes sense. But we've seen a lot of times in movies where it's just way too convenient the way your character is able to instantly assess the information that they need very fast. Or they're at the bar and it just so happens that the news is reporting on the story that's about them. So it's just the kind of thing that you have to be careful with it so it doesn't feel like you're just uh, cheating a little bit. Okay, looks like we have a question from Meep. Go ahead, Meep. Can, can, okay, there we go. So I, I didn't know how to actually word it to type it out, but when we're talking about exposition here, are we like referring to literally saying and explaining something, or are we talking about the overall like idea of how to convey information um, in a story. Is, is, is that how we're looking at this? Yeah, so yeah, that's that's exactly it. Exposition is the con communication of information in a story. One form of exposition is having characters talk about stuff, right? One okay. form of it is having them see it on the news. One form of it. So like, yeah, these are all different just ways that we learn, we the audience, learn essential information in a narrative. Okay, I was just trying to pinpoint that. Mostly for all of the stuff we would be talking about later. But I was also just kind of wondering, like, if this was just talking about spoken word exposition versus, like, actual visual exposition. Yeah, we're talking about all types. So the, both are very valid, and there's good, there's good and not so good ways to use both. Okay, that's all I wanted to know. Thank you. Sure, thanks for the question. We have a question from Dan. I've invited you up, so feel free to accept, or you can type out the question if you can't. Mm. 
So the invitation is sent, so feel free to... Oh, there we go. Hey, Dan, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, great. What's your question? Um, I had a question about... You know how sometimes in comedic pieces the character's like, man, and the exposition is like, man, I sure hope that nothing happens to my uncle. This mm -hmm. just in, main character's uncle dies. Right. Is that allowed in comedic setting? Because it's a comedic setting, would I be breaking the rules that we're setting here? Well, these aren't really rules. Um, this is more like tools and like um, observations that we're making about how exposition works or good, way, effective ways to use it. So I wouldn't look at these as rules as much as like resources and things that you have access to. Um, in that context, if you've seen it before in a show or movie, then clearly something about it works. Um, and whether, I mean, you may have laughed at it or you may not have, but it sounds like that may have served its job in that moment. Um, there's no reason, there's no actual rule that says you can't just smash cut to a character learning something right away, especially in a comedic context in which that might kind of be the punchline is like how quickly we smash from, I hope this thing doesn't happen to that thing happens right away. So it sounds like it worked in that specific instance. All right. I'll keep that in mind. Okay. Uh, yeah, hope that answers the question. Thank you, Dan. It does. All right. Um, maybe we can... I'm wondering how I can expand on the answer a little bit just to make sure that I'm covering the whole thing. I guess I would say or maybe if we can expand the question a little bit to how much can you use humor to sort of uh, gloss over exposition? And the answer is quite a bit. Like, uh, sometimes, in fact, the dumber the explanation for something is in a comedy, sort of the funnier that it is. And it can, it can be used to patch holes in a story sometimes if we laugh at it and we sort of, in, a, in the world of comedy, we understand that funny is more important than anything else. And if something kind of makes sense as an explanation and is funny enough, sometimes we can just sort of buy it. I think a good example of this that I've seen was in the movie The Lost City with Brad Pitt's character. He's kind of this adventure treasure hunter who I'll, uh, this is a bit of a spoiler for this movie from a couple years ago, but uh, he gets shot with a gun and it seems like he's dead. Later on, we learn he's not actually dead, and um, he has a bandage on his head. And as he's climbing back up onto his boat with the other characters, they're like, I thought you got shot in the head. Like, I thought you were dead. Your brain was gone. And he's like, don't you know you only use 10% of your brain? <laughs> so it's such a dumb explanation. You only use 10% of your brain, so he's fine that he got shot in the brain. But in a comedy, it does sort of, like, the fact that it makes you laugh uh, sort of affords you extra story power a little bit. So I hope that maybe just to expand on that answer for Dan's question, yeah, you can use comedy in that way to gloss over certain explanations, or if you make if you make the answer funny enough, sometimes we don't really mind if something doesn't make total sense. We have a question from T. Taylor. What is wrong with dream sequences or flashbacks? Um, nothing inherently is wrong with dream sequences or flashbacks, but often these are just overly relied upon to um, clumsily communicate story information. So, for instance... It doesn't really feel motivated sometimes when your character might have a flashback or a dream to something, so that is just a common trap to fall into where your character just, oh, well, the audience needs to know something now, so I guess we'll have a flashback. Whereas if something specifically reminds your character of some trauma in their past, and maybe we use that to trigger the flashback that can feel a little more organic and natural, um, there's nothing, it's not impossible to use dream sequences or flashbacks, and we see good ones often, but... We try not to lean on them too heavily for exposition. That's just like a very general rule. Okay. Um, looks like we have some people posting uh, PDFs in the chat, which is great. Um, we may have to ask you to wait a little bit to, to post these, though, just so that we have them all in the same place. They don't get lost. Thank you for saving the exporting it properly as a PDF, though. All right. Um, so... Let's uh, continue with slideshow and talk about good exposition or ways to make exposition better before we get into sample scenes. So uh, let's just look at some really kind of classic screenwriting advice, writing tips and things like this. Pope in the Pool. This is in the um, Blake Snyder's book, Save the Cat. And um, I think you don't, we don't have to look at that one book as any kind of gospel or any, any one book or any text as the exact stuff we're supposed to do, but there's useful tools in all of these things. So we can look at this specifically as a tool the Pope in the Pool is the idea that, you know, there's a movie about the plot to kill the Pope, and the Pope needs to, uh, you know, the Pope's assistants and representatives are sharing really key info about the plot coming up, and in the background, the writer had a scene where the Pope was swimming laps around the pool, 
as these characters were talking about this, which sort of gives us something interesting to look at. We're so kind of enamored with watching something weird and funny happening that we don't really notice that we're being fed facts in the same way. This is really just a way of boiling down this idea of doing two things at once, exposition and something entertaining that distracts the audience from noticing that they are being fed that exposition. So this is just kind of a small example of what we're doing here. A lot of the time, what makes the best versions of exposition really work is couching them in something else, allowing them to do something besides just to deliver info. So um, we can also do a, our fair share of heavy lifting in exposition by leaving out certain details that just aren't relevant. And sometimes we don't really need to know the exact specifics behind why or how something works. And, we, and part of being really good at delivering information in a story is realizing what the audience needs to know and things that just aren't ugly don't. Um, and so it can even get to the point where if you ask too many questions or over explain stuff, it can confuse people more and it will start to lose them. Whereas if you do the right amount, people are willing to take your word on it. So they sort of suspend their disbelief more. There's that stage where if you, you explain it until the rational part of your audience starts kicking in and makes them just start to wonder, well, if that's how that works, well, how does how is the other engine being powered? If one engine is being powered by, you know, Floton Protoss um, um, energy, well, then what's powering the other engine? And does that need its own fuel too? And does every ship run on different fuel? Or whatever it is, like, we don't want people to start overthinking some certain stuff. So we have to be willing to summarize and cut things out. We, we're trying to avoid this uncanny valley where you will lose the audience and they're not willing to suspend that disbelief. So sometimes, it's, and I think we have a, I have a good example of that um, here, just from the script from USS Callister, which is um, my favorite episode of Black Mirror, in which we need to explain some pretty complicated concepts within a page or two. And I think in this case, our main, consider that our main character is um, Nanette here, who is learning that she has woken up inside a video game that she's essentially trapped in. Um, and we cover this in just a couple lines. Other characters are explaining this to her, but in their own voice, using their own sort of, you know, filtering it through their personality. They're not just reading from a chart. They're sort of explaining this to her in a way that only they would. They sort of talk over each other. They sort of fight to get a word in, and each of them is trying to explain it in their own way. But at the end of the day, they manage to explain it quite concisely and conveying the idea that she's a, a digital clone. Um, so you can read this. I'm not going to read the, the entire thing if you want, but I just want to draw your attention to the end, specifically where they're explaining how this digital cloning device works. Shania says, he built some gizmo. And one of the other characters starts to theorize an advanced biometric DNA virtual clone replicator, and then the other character just interrupts him. It's like, right, okay, exactly, yes, a fucking gizmo. He fed your DNA in, he grew, grew you in the computer, and here you are. So she sort of cuts through that over-explanation and says, okay, but don't worry about that. Here's what you need to know. And so much of just this, the effective conveyance of info in a script is knowing what your audience need to know, needs to know and when. And there's a big difference between things that we don't know. There's two major genres of that. There's mystery and there is confusion. Can someone explain the difference? Go ahead, Nacho. Your mic is on mute, Nacho. Yeah, for me, it's something where it's kind of like, if something is mysterious, I'm really eager to find out the answer and curious, and I'm like reading faster and faster because I want to turn the page to find out the answer. Mm. And if something is confusing, I find myself going backwards, backtracking to try to, oh, wait, what did I just read? Or did I miss something five pages back that explains this? So for me, it's sort of like, slows down the read versus I'm more eager to read faster with the mystery. Yeah, that's to a find out the answer. Mm -hmm. I, I think you're right on. And um, in that in that same way, confusion is almost always bad. We don't want the audience to be confused. We want them to be sort of intrigued and leaning in. And if, if they feel confident that the answers are out there and that they continue watching, they will learn those answers. That's a good sign that you have created mystery. If you've created confusion, it feels like they've missed something. I think that's how Nacho put it a second ago. It feels like if you, if you flip back, you might learn the answer. Or maybe it feels like the author doesn't know the answer. And it it's just shakes our confidence quite a lot to create confusion on the page because it's going to indicate that we have lost, or it's going to cause the loss of that reader's confidence and also attention. So that's why effective exposition is so important because that's how, it's the, our best tool for avoiding confusion and creating this sense of mystery instead. 
We don't want the audience to be wondering, asking, or worrying about things that don't matter, and we want them to be paying attention where we want them paying attention. Um, only in really, really limited circumstances do you want the audience to feel true confusion. Um, and it should never be for more than, like, a scene. And when we get to the end of that scene, we should resolve that confusion into mystery. And we should say, okay, I feel like I have all the info that the writer wants me to have right now. And the more that I read, the more about it I will learn, and the more I will be able to piece together exactly how this all fits. Um, Black Mirror is just a great show that every episode is like, you have to watch at least half of the episode to understand what's really going on here. Every episode almost built, has this built-in question of, wait, okay, what's really going on? And some episodes tell you quicker, and some take a little longer to fully unspool that. But that is one of the metrics that we use to just control audience attention and confidence in us, is by answering the questions they need to know, and by leaving the things that they don't know yet, feel like making them feel like they're intentionally unknown, and that they, we are going to incrementally make progress towards learning those answers. And then when we do, there will be payoff that was worth our investment in those questions. Uh, here's a question in the chat. What's the difference between aha and huh? Are you talking about this script specifically or just in general? Is that something on this page? Or are you just asking about these two words? Um, not a question. The difference between aha uh -huh and huh. Oh, I see. You're saying that's the difference between confusion and mystery. I see what you mean. Got it. <laughs> um, mystery being aha. Yes, I see where you're going with this or I'm, I want to know more. And huh being the audience has missed something. I see. Yeah, totally. Okay, um, so let me maybe pause right here before I get into voiceover and just see, do we have any questions so far just on in management of audience information? You can either raise a hand or you can type in the chats. Here's a question from Cinnamon. Sometimes I'm not sure whether to put exposition in when it makes no difference to the story, but might be interesting. Like in one thing I'm writing, the character's an immigrant. She and her family immigrated when she was little, but it makes no big difference to the story. I guess the question is about knowing the right amount of backstory to include. Yeah, that's the thing is that it, to, to me, exposition means this is vital info. If it's not vital info that we need to know moving forward in, in, in the sense of it's vital for your character's motivation and telling us why they're doing what they're doing, if it's not vital in the sense of we need this to understand what the actual, the actual events of the story, if it's not vital in those two kind of major key ways, then it, it doesn't sound like exposition to me. It sounds like, yeah, you are just kind of expanding on your character's background or giving us sort of like more of a taste of, the, of how they got here and who they are. Um, there's not really a hard and fast rule. I mean, when it, the answer to when is there too much is when the audience starts to get bored and to feel like we're not making progress anymore. Um, and progress can come in many different forms. Um, progress can come in the form of your character is engaging in conflict scenes in which they accomplish their goal or don't accomplish their goal and they're pushed closer to or further from their end goal. That's a really common way to make progress, but there's other ways characters can make progress too. Characters can make internal progress. They can make, you know, they can make headway into rationalizing or understanding or getting over something. Or sometimes they need to solve some kind of quandary in themselves or sometimes they're just changing in terms of personality. Or sometimes they are on a kind of moral decline. Or sometimes, you know, any number of sliders can be adjusted that can indicate that progress is happening. And if it feels like the backstory that you're delivering in the scene isn't contributing to any kind of progress, it's not giving us a clear picture of who your character is and giving us relevant info that tells us why they're doing what they're doing, it isn't setting up any key rules of the world, then chances are you could cut back on it or really just... Find some other way to communicate that. I mean, it's um, it may not require a whole scene, may not require a whole conversation. It could be something we convey and how your character holds themselves and carries themselves. We could say your care instead of having a whole scene where we learn your character used to be a carpenter, we could just show that they have very rough and calloused hands. Instead of saying that they grew up poor in Mississippi, we could just have them speak with the appropriate dialect for that region and econ socioeconomic status. So there's sometimes other workarounds where we don't have to use exposition and you can sort of layer in that backstory in different ways, particularly in novels. In movies and TV, a lot of that has to, like, in movies especially, we have to really be careful about the backstory that we go too deeply into and, and things that we aren't just sort of implying or suggesting because every scene needs to be really relevant and feel like it fits into the greater whole. Um, and it feels like it should almost always feel like we're making progress towards something. So I would say try to use your exposition to do that. 
Um, and if it's going to require a whole scene, then it should be something that could not have been taken out and have the story make sense. Otherwise, I would find other ways to sort of sew that in throughout the rest of the narrative. I hope that helps. It's kind of a fire hose answer where I just said like a hundred things, but <clears throat> hope that covers the main points there. Um, let's see. Any other questions about audience information so far, or maybe specific genres and how they do this? Neat, go ahead. So, like, what do you do? It, um, what do you do if what you have to explain is like something that? Okay, so I know that there are going to be some instances, but there will probably be things that you'll have to explain in a story, but they're not the the way you'd have to explain it necessarily wouldn't be like interesting, but it's very essential. Like, maybe that's too broad of a question. Like, how would you? How, how would you like like there are some there are some movies or scenes where like someone's giving a lecture or someone's like explaining something like in like a like a sit down fashion where it's like in like let's say it's an action film and like maybe for example i don't know why it's the first one that comes into my mind but i remember there was a sequence where there where the avengers were on like an aircraft carrier and nick fury was like giving this sort of explanation about why it was like important for them to be the heroes that they needed them to be but it was literally just done with them all sitting down at like a table mm -hmm. like how do you take a scene like that and make it how do you take a scene where exposition is done in a very seemingly boring scenario and make it interesting because i have a situation like that that i'm trying to figure out where i'm just like how do you make the idea of explaining so e explaining to someone what their job is like how do you make that interesting uh like something but, like i would normally say by showing them around the job site or throwing them into the thick of things right away or something that requires the characters to be very active like imagine we take the character to where they're going to be trained but then the mentor gets distracted or lost and the characters that now they're on their own with only half a sheet of instructions that they're forced to work from and just kind of figure it out as they go does that make sense how you can like ev almost almost all the time if you can throw your character in and have them actually forced to touch stuff and do stuff and kind of learn things firsthand and feel the heat of the fire and the pavement under their feet or whatever and like feel the consequences of things it's going to be a more engaging way to teach a character about a new job or their, their new role or whatever it is in that rather than just like rather than just like making it like a tour of a facility that is just like a really long kind of really boring thing to sort of sit through I would personally try to find something else interesting going on in those scenes. Um, and the so, like, for instance, those Avengers scenes that you were talking about, the answer in those cases is those are action movies that sort of require sometimes we need a break from constant action. And having a scene where your characters are all just sitting down and talking can be really refreshing and can be a nice pause. But the way that you keep it interesting is really good characters and really good dialogue. I mean, it sounds dumb to, to explain it like that, but I would maybe go back and look at specifically which characters are controlling those scenes, um, which characters are kind of the comic relief in any of those given scenes. I remember, you know, isn't Captain America almost the comic relief in some of those scenes where he's like, I don't understand that reference when people are like talking about stuff that he doesn't know about because he's yeah. from the forties or every character has their own sort of like personality like every, conflict with someone like else on the team. Go ahead. Like give everybody a purpose in, in like those kinds of scenes or sequences. Like oh, they'll yeah, just have sure. it. For sure. Have it convey, have it convey something in the story, even if it's not necessarily exposition. It has to serve a purpose. Yeah, or I mean, you get a lot of make it funny, make it entertaining, and so make it exciting. Make it like um, show characters clashing off each other and and watch their personalities kind of um, bump heads, you know. And um, even if they're only if they're talking about okay, we have a monster to go fight. Well, you have one character that's like, I think we should fight it like this with lasers, and one character says, I think we should fight it with swords. And then we're, we're learning about its weaknesses. One can be like, well, no, but swords would never kill it because it has insect shell. And one character is like, well, you can't kill it with lasers. It has a force field. You know, that's a good way to sort of use that exposition as, as ammunition almost. It's just a term mm. that I've heard before to, to you want to sling the information at the other characters, right? So instead of, uh, you know, you have a character say, uh, you know, um, you haven't cleaned your room in five years. Do you know that? You know, rather than... Um, 
you know, like if we use that as as a way to attack another character, it kind of makes sense that they would say something on its face and kind of just like share that fact very directly. Anyway, mm. I, I realize I'm, again, just kind of going a lot of different directions with this answer. The, the real answer is you have to make the scenes entertaining, and then people won't feel the, that the exposition is a problem. And the best way to make scenes entertaining is just fantastic dialogue, fantastic characters, and um, moreover, having other things going on at once. Like, if we can have mm. character relationships that are developing in a scene while we are also learning more about the monster we're about to go fight, you know, two people are becoming friends over the course of this explanation. Two characters are becoming enemies over the course of the explanation. Or it could be, you know, pick some other thing going on in the room, pick a different location for it to take place at, um, add a ticking clock. You know, I think Terminator has a, so many good explanation scenes. Go ahead. That's not a, that's not a bad one, actually. Um, I like that situation you put in there, two characters becoming friends. If it's a workplace and there are two characters that are sort of like, you know, you're probably not the only new person in the room. So it could be, you know, two coworkers kind of, meeting each other which gives more credence to what's actually happening sure yeah yeah i mean show two instead of having one character getting trained about their new job show two characters getting trained and then they're forced it sort of maybe could become a competition between them that would be a fun way to kind of do the do learn the important information while also just making the sequence as fun as possible and if you ever have a scene where you're like I feel like I'm getting the imp important info out here. The scene's boring, but I just need this scene. I would look at those as opportunities because as an opportunity, you can dive into it. And if you make it really awesome, and that's essentially turning your weak points into your strong points. And it's like, armor, you know, you armor the weak points or whatever. And in, in that case, it will make the movie just flow really well if the exposition is like the most fun part. Okay. I guess we can come back to it later when everyone's doing all of their sharing, so I don't sure. want to take up too much of your time, but thank you. Okay, no problem. Yeah, I hope that gave you some good answers there about yeah. maybe more than you asked for, but <laughs> I hope that worked. I appreciate, I appreciate it. Thank you, Neve. Okay, I'll answer a couple more questions from the text chat, and then I think I have a few more slides, and then we can uh, share student stuff. Okay, um, here's a question from Kev. How do you feel about no exposition when it comes to selling a script? I really like 2001 A Space Odyssey because it explains very little, but Nolan was told by producers he needed to add explanations with his similar film, Interstellar. Um, no exposition when selling a script. So, uh, the way that, I mean, different narrative styles, well, storytelling techniques have, have changed a lot over the years and things that worked in the 70s or 80s are not necessarily always going to work now and things that work now are maybe not going to work in 30 or 40 more years um we can look at you know early films from the 1940s and 50s often had a few text screens at the beginning that would sort of lay out all the major pieces and and or like sometimes silent films would come out start off with a screen of text that tells you where we are and what's going on almost like a stage play program that tells you where the play is going to take place um so these things are always changing. I, I don't think that, I mean, like, currently the trend is very subtle exposition that is fun and doesn't feel like it's getting in the way. I feel like in in 50 years, maybe people will have a different idea of what that looks like. And and right now I would try not to make your script feel burdened by too much expl over explanation of things. Um, that would in fact, yes, be an impediment to selling a script if it felt labored and if it felt like we have too much info that we need to know or that it's expressed in a way that is just boring, that will count against you, yes. So in that sense, I think it would make a script harder to sell if you don't do these things well. So you should try to make your exposition as painless and fun as possible. Uh, let's see, so here's a question from Jay. What about exposition about a relationship between two characters where I need to show the main character being disconnected and not focused on it, but the relationship itself has little weight in the story, whereas the personal reason slash conflict is there throughout. So you're showing a relationship between two people where you show that the main character is disconnected and not focused on it, but the relationship doesn't matter that much. Okay, I think I understand. So uh, in that case, I think that less is more. I mean, you're trying to show that a character is disconnected and not focused on a relationship. That, that's something that we can ascertain from the way that they answer their phone, right? Like if they if the if their phone comes up, or if their phone rings and it's their partner's number and they roll their eyes, that tells us a lot about that relationship in a very quick and efficient way, right? Or think of Succession. How does Shiv keep her husband Tom's number saved in her phone? She saves his full name, Tom Wamsgans, his entire his full name, which feels very kind of 
cold and distant for a married couple, doesn't it? But it very quickly shows us, okay, how do they feel about each other? What is that exact dynamic like? So I guess I would look for small ways that you can convey this. I mean, it, you, this might be something you can communicate in just a couple shots if you're careful with them. I mean, if you show your character driving in a car and listening to music, and then very slowly the voice of their significant other fades in and we hear them talking, and they're like, did you just hear anything I said? Your main character looks across and is like, oh yeah, I'm listening, babe. That might be just like a one-shot way. We don't even need to show the other person, right? Like, so if it if we draw you keep the focus on your main character and don't make it don't, don't try to paint this character as if the you know the spouse or whatever as if they're going to be really matter we don't need to know their name really we don't need to have a lot of focus on um their their uh they don't need a lot of dialogue um i think that you can do a lot with a little um and we're going to assume that something becomes more important the more you show of it so the more screen time something has we just our way of understanding western style storytelling is that you keep the focus on the things that matter the most. So I would say, don't show too much of this relationship if it doesn't matter. Or if it does, maybe you know, keep the wife or girlfriend framed out for a lot of it. Keep the focus on your character himself as he's on his phone at a party or whatever it is. Like if you want to make him feel lonely and disconnected, then and you don't want to make it feel like this other person matters, then you don't have to show or engage with a lot of them. You don't have to give them a lot of story weight. And we can do a lot of this in just a few small moments here and there, rather than adding whole scenes that are required to convey this pretty simple idea. Pollock asks, which is recommended, visual or verbal exposition? So in a movie or a book, visual, ex or sorry, in a movie or a TV show, visual exposition is usually better. There are, that's not 100% of the time gonna be a rule. There are great explanation scenes, especially if we can find something else fun to be doing at the same time. If you're in a book, we can do either one and make it equally interesting. But we have to kind of take advantage of the medium that we're in. And in movies and TV, we have to be as visual as possible most of the time. And the more of the heavy lifting that you can do with visuals, the better. Okay, um, so it looks like that's all the questions for now. Um, I'm going to just check in on these last couple slides. I just want to go over voiceover. And um, a little bit of, I'll be able to call a volunteer for this paragraph of exposition from a horror novel and then we will move right into uh scripts or scenes or just maybe you guys have an exposition question and you want to ask about how you would convey something to the audience in your particular work and we can do that okay um let's start with voiceover is voiceover bad uh, no, voiceover is not bad. A lot of people have this idea that voiceover is bad or that the pros hate it or that people will throw away a script if it has voiceover or that writing teachers all detest it. And if you even dare to attempt voiceover, you're an amateur that everyone's going to hate. <coughs> um, I love voiceover. I use it all the time. I'm really big fan of seeing it done well. That's the thing is that it's one of these things that has to really be done well. And if it is done well, can make the whole work come together. And if it's done badly, can ruin the entire thing. So it's like kind of a risky ingredient to use. Um, and if you're going to use it, you should commit to it. I mean, try to commit to a scheme and a, a rule for how it will be utilized. If First of all, you should, we should know, is your character commenting on things in the moment or referring back to things as if they lived them in the past, right? So if they're going to have that future kind of foresight, or not foresight, if they have that future uh, retrospect that they are going to be able to bring to their commentary, if they're going to be like, I was about to make the biggest mistake of my life, then that should be the point of view that they are in the entire time. Um, if they are commenting on things as they happen um, in the moment, like just kind of reacting to things, then we should stick to that method the entire time. And we shouldn't really mix those together um, unless there's some crazy good reason for doing so. So voiceover can take that form. I mean, voiceover can take other interesting forms too, where maybe it's something like I, Tanya, where your character is in the future being interviewed or in a documentary or something, and we use sort of clips from that interview or the documentary to sort of narrate things that are going on in the past. That's another way to do it. There's plenty of ways to do voiceover that aren't just your character kind of in a disembodied third dimension or you know fourth, fifth dimension um, commenting on things that happened to them in the past. Lots of different ways to do it. It can get into some different techniques and different ways to use it best but let me take this question first so i have a question regarding like exposition when characters are sort of talking like let's say you are like having a horror movie right and the characters are discussing like the dark past or a dark history of like i don't know let's say a building like a haunted house mm -hmm. but for example okay. and like the characters are spending the night there and you have this character who's very knowledgeable of the dark history of the house 
And so with the exposition, they would like narrate it. So it's like, how would you exactly feel about that? Like when the character is the exposition explaining the dark history of this. I want to see the character like, traits that they bring to that explanation. I mean, are they trying to scare their friends as much as possible? In which case, they might play up certain aspects of the story or tell it differently than if they're conveying uh, the story in a way that they're trying to get their friend to leave, right? Or if they're telling the story in a way that they are trying to, um, I don't know, attract other people to come stay with them. Or I would look at what is their specific objective and why they're telling this, and how does that inform the tactics that they'll use in how they tell the story? Like the details they'll embellish, the things that they will focus on, the words that they'll use to tell that story. I mean, they can bring their personality to that explanation. And if you make it entertaining, then it won't feel as annoying to the reader. And it's like, I was thinking like it would be used to warn the protagonist, you know, like, oh, don't stay in this house. Dark things happened here. Something like that. Okay, sure. And I think that your character might also have to do a quick read on, is this does does this person believe in dark things right like if if they have to yeah. they may have to change tactics halfway through if they realize oh wait they aren't buying into the ghost thing should i try something else should i try showing them my arm that was bitten off by the ghost should i try should i try lying to them should i try telling them if you go there i'm going to slash your tires you know that your character if they have to sort of change tactics halfway through or partway through an explanation that can also make it really fun and engaging Okay, well, I hope that answered that question. Thank you for asking. Um, basically, character voice will make something entertaining. People are just entertaining to us. Like, a person is almost an unlimited source of entertainment to other people. Um, and so if you just have someone funny, someone scary, someone creating some kind of interesting emotional effect as they tell a story or explain something, if they can explain it in that sort of fascinating, intriguing way, then we will not be annoyed by it. We'll like it, unless there's, you know, unless it goes on for hours. Thank you for the question. Um, here's a question. Can we use voiceover as main character's thoughts? Uh, yeah, you can. Um, so uh, let's get into some different ways to use voiceover. So first things first, yes, you can absolutely use it. And I think almost half of my scripts have used it in the past. So I, I really, really like it and use it all the time. Readers and producers do not look down on it. I have had scripts placed in nickel semifinals and things like this and have had, that, have had lots of voiceover. Why do people think it's bad? Well, because it's often used to show us things that we, the audience, can already see or that we would be able to put together from simply watching the story unfold. Um, so yes, you can use it, the voiceover, for your character's thoughts, but they shouldn't be obvious thoughts if that's what you're doing. It should be thoughts that we only could have communicated through this voiceover. So that's why it's really useful sometimes if you have characters that have an interesting interiority or inner life to them, like one of the best examples is this show, The End of the Effing World on Netflix where we have two main characters that both have voiceovers that both um, are sort of from their point of view in the moment, I think. Um, and they are, um, they both have interesting stuff going on with them. Um, our sort of main character here is a budding serial killer psychopath who is sort of dating this new girl and he's planning to murder her. Um, and that's what we sort of learned in our first episode. But we also, because we have his voiceover, we sort of see that he's very conflicted about it. He isn't quite sure if he wants to or not. He's starting to kind of like her. He's changing his mind. He's starting to see her differently and see the world differently. Um, and that's all stuff that if you just saw him sitting there staring at the knife and we didn't have his thoughts, we wouldn't really understand what he was conflicted about or why. It would just sort of seem like he was plotting his next move, right? So that's one of those cases where the character has an interesting inter... Oh, Dexter. Doesn't Dexter have a voiceover? Dexter's another case where... It helps to create that sense of sympathy and connection to a character that we otherwise would not have because we can't see what's going on in their head. So that's just a really useful way to use voiceover. If you have a character that has something that they cannot express otherwise, or if they have some trait of theirs that won't otherwise be able to make its way to the surface or, or manifest, um, or that we, we, ju we just wouldn't have known about unless they were able to somehow reach through the screen and tell us about it in voiceover, then... Um, you know, you, you don't usually need it, but um, if you have some brilliant voice for your character or some secret or some other side of them that is not immediately apparent, then it can be great for all those things. Pollock is mentioning you. Yeah, you is another great example where unless we had this guy's sort of voiceover, he would just seem like a total evil creep. And he is an evil creep, but because we have the sort of voiceover that can give a, tell us specifically what he's thinking and what, where, where he's coming at this from, he's not stalking this woman because he hates her he's stalking her because he wants to sort of protect her 
And because of that, we can almost start to root for him in a dark, bleak, messed up way, because we see that he does have sort of a relatable motivation, even if it is totally twisted in a way. So hope that helps and hope that you see that uh, voiceover is great for expressing thoughts that would not have been otherwise clear or obvious to us. So um, we want to enrich our experience of the story with voiceover. Some narrators also have the ability to sort of control how the story is told or like move us around between different scenes or they can say, wait, wait, oh, I forgot to tell you about this, which I think people like Shane Black and Chuck Palahniuk have done really well in their scripts before, like Kiss Kiss Bang Bang is like the best script for this, where the narrator actually is like, ah, shoot, I'm a terrible narrator, sorry, let's rewind, and it all really works and is funny, and it's such a clever way of, expo of like conveying this info. It works well with characters with this interiority that I mentioned. All right, we can also use it to build suspense or set up key parts of the story before they happen, if there is this element of retrospect, where the character is looking back on their life and they might be able to sort of foreshadow things for us by saying things like, you know, I had no idea that he would ruin my whole life. Something like that, we might be like, oh, I wonder why that character, that they seem to be friends, what on earth could make him ruin her life later? Um, so we have that ability to kind of seed in questions and build mystery and suspense using the voiceover at times if you want. Um, and then last, uh, we can use it to set a tone and a mood for the world. In addition to these other uses, of course, it might just sort of lead to a certain feeling for the work, like um, Lord of the Rings, which has this, you know, the Kate Blanchett voiceover, which gets us started. The ancient elf queen Galadriel is telling us about how the world is cracked and broken and coming to an end. It makes it feel very epic, and it, like we're about to open a chapter in an ancient tome. Um, and sometimes you want that. Uh, we also have shows like Pushing Daisies or Amelie, which have a narrator. It's not just a character in the story. It's an actual sort of storybook style narrator that gives this the whole thing the feeling of kind of intentional artificiality or like a Wes Anderson movie, which might have a voiceover that makes it feel kind of like a stage play or kind of like this little constructed dollhouse world in whatever way. So um, do you want to just set these rules for yourself as to how your voiceover works? You don't want to be mixing them up or muddling the waters or saying sometimes he speaks in the moment and sometimes he speaks in retrospect. It just doesn't make sense to do that. And we want to be consistent and commit to this. And if you have voiceover, you typically have to either use it at the beginning and ending or just the beginning or just the ending or all throughout. But you can't really kind of just use it once or twice in the middle. It just does. It, and, and there's weird examples. Or not weird. I shouldn't say there are other examples that I have seen in other cultures media where sometimes they do this. I remember there's like an episode or two of Squid Game where suddenly we just have Gi Hun's voiceover like in the middle of an episode and we do that like twice. It's not done in American media. So unless maybe for a comedic effect, for, for a comedy moment, you can do it. But generally, if you're doing voiceover, it either bookends the story or it's all throughout. Looks like we have a question from Paul. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, so um, there's certain, I guess, things I want to express within the story that I don't know. Um, I guess, like, um, so, like, okay, so I'm, like, a, a big fan of, like, anime, and you said, like, in Eastern media and stuff, they, they tend to do a lot more with the, they, 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 tend to use voiceover more and i've noticed that especially in like anime and stuff where they will start out with the character's like monologue just like explaining the entire world and everything pretty much yeah i don't really yep. want to do that but there's aspects of it that or of the story world that i'm having a bit of a hard time expressing in a way that's like obvious you know what i mean Okay, well, maybe um, we can help. What are you trying to communicate, or what rule or element of the world are you having trouble with? So, um, the the creature is being, um, I guess, like, the explanation for why she is saving her, uh, saving, the, the, okay, so the main character in the first scene saves a different character um, from prison. And the reason she does that is because in this world, during the witch trials, the people being executed keep turning into these big ass like monsters, right? Okay. And I explain it later in the in the script, but um, I've gotten the note 
that like they don't know why she saved her even though it's explained and i was like okay i don't know if i how to make it clearer without just like straight up saying it at the very beginning this is why i'm saving her you know what i mean well, if let me just uh, ask you a couple of questions maybe um so are the jailers a, you're saying they're going to execute her and thus she will turn into a monster but they're not aware of that yeah okay and so it would seem to me that your other character would then have the opportunity to be like hey don't execute her she'll turn into a monster but are you saying there's some reason she can't do that uh yeah uh she is a witch and it is the witch trials Okay, so, so she can't reveal that she is a witch by saying that she knows that the other person will turn into a big monster. Yeah. Okay. But how do they not know? So they don't really know what's causing all these, like, monster attack type things. Um, They just know it has they something to do with the witches. Every time, they, every time they execute someone? Yeah, and they think it's because they're witches, and that's why that's happening. But that's not really the reason. But so is there damage left behind by these other monster attacks? Um, not, not in a way that's obvious, I guess. Well, uh, how bad are the monsters if they don't cause any damage? I realize we're maybe going a little off course, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of ways that you can, like, very clearly visually set up what the cost and consequences of executing this person will be, which would be, you know, there's a church with a big hole in the roof from the tentacle monster earlier, and we can, like... If we see clear examples of that, then we will sort of know what is about to happen. Or maybe your, does your character have a spell book she can look through and be like, oh, crap, and sees a depiction of somebody being burned at the stake and turning into a Cthulhu or something? Uh, there's nothing like that. Um, I was considering something like that. Um, but I ended up not doing it. Okay. Um, well, without reading a specific script, I can't say for sure, but my instinct, I could just tell you what I would suggest probably doing, um, is finding these clear visual ways of showing what the cost and consequences of this will be. You show characters that are concerned that those things will happen. Even like We don't even need to see a person turn into a monster and destroy a building necessarily. I mean, it would help a little, but if it's early on in your script, maybe you don't want to hit us with that too early. But, I mean, are, is there an artist depiction of it somewhere? Is there damage left behind by it? Is there a giant dead monster corpse somewhere that we can see? Like, I think there must be something visual that we can show exactly why your characters are worried about this and what will happen if this execution goes through. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know, because, like, later there's, like... Okay, so there's two monster attacks within this, like, first, uh, like, pilot type thing. And... Later, she's like, you know, uh, well, one of the side characters is like, what is that thing? And the main character is like, oh, it's one of the people who got executed. Um, okay. You know, it, I don't know. There's like different points where I explain, you know, like what the concern is as far as like why they need them not to get executed. But so, and, but hang on, well, let's go back to this word. You're explaining why, but are we seeing why? Like how how do you mean? Like I mean, we are your opening scene is the people cleaning up all the timber from the ground after a monster smashed a hole in a wall, or like we see someone get executed and turn into a big horrible creature. Like to us, we uh, we would just need to like it's the difference between your characters trapped in an island and somebody explains to them you can't leave because there's mines, you can't leave because there's all these things, and then they just don't try to leave. Versus the character tries to leave and gets blown up by the mines. Like I think we just need to. If we show these things to the audience, we show them... I mean, does the town have anti-monster stations, all through, like watchtowers with alarm bells? And we see that there's people up there scanning the woods at all times. We sort of get the, a sense that they're very afraid of these things. Maybe they have a pit where they bury them all that has a bunch of you know cr crucifixes all around it that they're all terrified they're going to rise from the dead. I think you should look for visual ways to communicate what's important in the story. Because it sounds like maybe your readers aren't picking up on them. Maybe you haven't uh, made them prominent enough. Or you haven't sort of... It hasn't been clear what the actual implications of those things are. Those are good ideas. Thanks. Okay, I hope that helps. Uh, I'm glad to. If you bring, if you come to lab, then we can look at specific pages or specific moments. If you want to brainstorm actual 
uh, more concrete solutions. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Do you have a question, Maxon? Hello. Hey, I hear you. Could you could you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay, so I, I guess this was a note I recently got on mine um, about even if the about like verbal exposition, even if like it's very clean and like it works it like through. I mean, if you work it through dialogue and stuff, um, they still say like you know nonverbal exposition is better and subtler. But then it got me wondering, like, you know how in, like, science fiction and maybe, like, disaster films where you have, like, the military personnel and they're all, like, expositing? Isn't that okay? Because it, it's, like, it feels like some plots have that are, like, complex, right? They have to be explained to the audience or else they won't catch what's going on, right? Sometimes. I mean, yeah, there's, there's ways to do it well. I mean, there, but if, I guess, the... And it's it's only ever going to come up as a problem if it if it's not entertaining, or if it feels like we're stopping the story, we're stopping the progress that we're making, and we are just now giving the audience info that they absolutely need. There's no other way that we could have given them. Um, so sometimes a general has to do a big rousing speech, or sometimes yeah, yeah, some like, characters start a new, I, I, a new my job. Mind was like jumping, oh, sorry, Maybe. my mind was like jumping to like. Armageddon, how you know you kind of I, I get that the the asteroid or whatever it is is on its way to Earth, mm-hmm. but then there's also like the explanation of it, and and it seems like there has to be an explanation of it because you know the, these are military personnel characters, yeah, and they're all talking about you know the saving the world and all that stuff. So it seems like you can't get around that. You can't make it nonverbal because. Everyone in the world would be talking about it theoretically. But. Yeah, there's there's cases where that works, and and I would look at the personalities of the characters. Like it's just having great characters and dialogue will carry you through those moments where you have to have them explain something, um, or doing multiple things at once. Like look at where can the scene take place? Does it take place in a nightclub so they can barely hear each other, so they have to yell? Does it take place in a library so they have to be really quiet? Does the a character? I mean, think of in, the big Independence Day speech. We gotta go fly the planes up and blow up the aliens is basically what he has to say, right? But yeah, yeah. he delivers it in a really specific way that only that character would, and it's a really memorable, well-written speech that doesn't that feels like we needed it at that moment. He needs to rile everybody up. He has that second objective of not just telling people what the plan is, but sort of motivating them to do the plan. So do you see how that kind of is doing two things at once, and that is making it more entertaining, even though it's just kind of us saying, okay, fly the planes up and do the boom-boom explosion? Yeah, yeah, Okay. So try to have something okay. else going on or a ticking clock in the in the same scene or think of all those great scenes in Terminator where Kyle Reese has to explain to Sarah Connor what's going on um, when there's like a bunch of them, but there's always some other objective at the same time. We have to run and explain this as we're running, so we're sort of out of breath. We have, we're explaining now what the robots are from the future, but we're hiding in a car in the parking lot, so we have to be quiet, and if we're too loud, he's going to hear us. So you can always find yeah. some other thing. Um, some like Even if the characters have to... Even if the the most logical way for something to unfold in this story is for characters just to talk it out, somebody's chewing gum in an annoying way. You know, like make something funny. Find find some point of interest. Find something like some dynamic that you can bring out, some personality trait that you can showcase. Just make it funny. Make it exciting. Make it scary. Make it tense. Um, if you can do any of it, or just make it memorable. Make it you know something that sticks with us. If you can do those things, then having just verbal exposition is not the worst thing, and sometimes it makes total sense. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Hope that helps. Thanks, Maxon. Okay. Um, so we let me just uh, finish our last slide, and then Michelle says she has to go soon, so maybe I can look at her pages if she's still here in like five minutes. Let me just check. Okay. So I do want to, before we get to um, the scenes posted by participants here, I wanted to get a volunteer to read this sequence here. And this is a paragraph from the first few pages of the short story called Nesters by Siobhan Carroll. This is a cosmic horror story. Um, Do we have a volunteer to read and answer some questions? Feel free to raise a hand, and I will call on you. Taylor, go ahead. Yeah, uh, do you just want me to read the highlighted portion? 
Yeah, maybe, let's look at the questions first, though. So um, the questions are going to be, when and where does the story take place? How do you know? Who's the point of view character? Tell us about her and her family in these couple different ways, just answering these basic questions. So you can preview that if you want. And then when you're ready, just go read it straight through. Cool. Sally followed Ma around the dugout, stuffing rags into the cracks where the dust had trickled through. Alice toddled after her. Ben watched from the bed, his feverish eyes glistening. At 14, he was taller than Sally and better at reaching the upper cracks. But what could be done? The dust long had him. If Ben were to move, Ma said it would be to her sister's place in Topeka, away from the land that was killing him. Better still, Ma said, would be to head out to California, where there was still work to be had. But Pa had heard about the cities. Many who went there came home poorer than before. They told tales of Hoover camps, the shame of being spat on by city dwellers. At least here they suffered together. At least here they had the land. To lose your land was to lose yourself. Her father had warned her and Ben. This was in the early years, when folks still thought next year would bring the rains back. All right, nice job reading. Thanks so much. Um, shall we answer some questions, Taylor? Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, go right ahead, or if you want me to go yeah, through them. Yeah, let's start with the first one. When and where does the story probably take place, do you think? Um, so this sounds like it... Um, I believe it's supposed to be in Kansas. Um, let me double check that. Uh, you don't have to double check. Just just based on what you have here in the paragraph. I mean, are you, are you basing that off the fact that she named Topeka? Yeah, I mean, it sounded like they, um, like, moving, they would be somewhere in the Midwest. That's mm -hmm. where it sounded like something like dust lung would exist. Um and yeah, I'm going to assume this is somewhere early 1900s. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. And how, what clued you into these things? Um, so the early 1900s, just the language being used, like um, things that I, like, it 100% it isn't where media, like, like fast transmitting media exists. Like, um, where definitely before TV, because I think you would have like um, an understanding of um, a better understanding of city life rather than these kind of assumptions about it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to just guessing based off of that. Um, then like um, maybe something with gold, the, the like post gold rush era where she mentions heading to California where there's still work to be had. Um, that kind of made me think like, um, what work would there be in California that could be spoken within this kind of vague distinction? Right. Um, yeah. So, um, that's where I'm coming from on that. Yeah. Yeah. Good points. Um, and, uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if the story actually fully specifies the answers to these things, but yeah, we see Midwest, somewhere that they're familiar enough with Topeka. I feel like if you weren't from Topeka, you would say we, we've moved to Kansas, right? But if you call the city by name, that to me tells me that they're more familiar with it or have been there before. Um, so that's just like clues that we're looking at. Hoover Camps, I believe, is a specific, it, probably a reference to, the um, what's his name? Uh, Hoover, Herbert Hoover was the president, right? Herbert Hoover, which was in the um, 1920s, right? No, 1930, 1929 to 33. So that gives us some just cultural context clues there. We know we can just look at some of the specific references that she's using and making here. Um, Merrickson in the chat says, the mother is referred to just as Ma should kind of give a giveaway. Yeah, it should kind of be a giveaway. Yeah, that sort of tells us. That's like a regional dialect thing that they don't use in all of the U.S. for sure. So who's the POV character, Taylor? Um, I believe it's... Um, I'm going to say... It's hard to say just... Um, I'm really unsure about that. I would say possibly uh, Sally. Yeah. Um, yeah, Sally. Okay, how do you know? Uh, just with it, starting with her following her mom, um, Ben is watching Sally, um, and it's these things are kind of revolving around her. Yes, exactly. So what does it say here? To lose your land was to lose yourself. Her father had warned her and Ben. So it, we're referring to her by default. 
in all these different sequences. And I know maybe some folks are not are, are here for the script camp stuff, and this is more novel focused. But these are just things that we can do, and we can see how much information you can pack into just one single paragraph in a, in a novel, right? And the ways that just by like the words that you use to refer to something can tell us when and where we are, who the POV character is, um, the kind of person they are, the types of thoughts they have, the things they focus on or notice. They can tell us when and where we are in the world. What about her and her family? Um, you kind of touched on their economic stash, status and like cultural situation here. Mid, uh, Midwest, early 1900s. Um, what do you think about their living situation? What do we learn about that? Um, I would definitely describe it as humble and modest. It doesn't seem like... It's one of those things where it's, it's hard to say that they're poor. Like, I would say they're not aware that they um, may be poor. Um, they're used to this lifestyle. Um, it's very humble um, and very blue collar. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say that it's, you know, they're living in extreme poverty, but definitely lower class. Yeah, I mean, they do have to get the kids to help them stuff rags in the walls to avoid dust blowing in through the cracks, which does not sound like something that rich people have to do. Yeah. Right. So the things that the characters consider normal actually is a really useful tool for exposition, wouldn't you say? Because the things that they don't remark upon or the things that they don't think are noteworthy actually sometimes tells us more than the things that they do think are noteworthy. Yeah, absolutely. Like, um, that whole, um, routine they're doing is pretty insane. Like, you know, living in like the, like now, um, and hearing those things, but they're just kind of gl like glossing over it, moving on. Like that's just something they're doing. The dust lung had him. Does she stop to tell us what the dust lung is? No, she just goes over that and um, moves past it. Um, I, I do like this kind of um, description here. Um, it's a really good world building of just glancing over it. Like, you, you should know what that is. It's very common here. Right, yeah. So the, the things that just are mentioned in passing by the characters or things that in a movie or, or a TV show setting imagine the camera doesn't linger on we just pan right past something like and we watch everyone just walking by like it's the most natural thing in the world um the opening sequence of the true blood is really good have you ever watched that yeah what, mm -hmm. and what kind of stuff do we see in that opening sequence um you see all those like i haven't watched it in a few years but that kind of like southern occult like um just a lot of like southern nature and um yeah, where does that take place? I think, like, Louisiana. Yeah, you see a lot of, like... I remember there's, like, a lot of, um, like, Spanish moss, swampland. Um, you see... Um, yeah, what do you see? You see, like, this... I can't remember if they show it in the opening, but, like, the... All those, like, weird, like, wooden effigy symbols. Yeah, th those are definitely part of it. I think the, the thing I was mostly getting at was... The fact that it shows that vampires are normalized in the world. We see like a billboard outside a church that says God hates fangs. We see, you remember this, and we see like um, anti-vampire graffiti and stuff like that. <laughs> so it's just sort of building, building up this idea that I, these are not really noteworthy things in the world. Like vampires are part of culture. I definitely thought you said true detective. Did I say true detective? Oh, I, no, I, you said true blood. You said true blood. I <laughs> okay. totally, I'm sorry. Those no, things I, are I've also, in, true I mean, blood. those shows are both set in Louisiana, though, I believe, and they do both have kind of occult imagery in the, in the openings. Um, but in any case, uh, yeah, so thinking about true blood, yeah, the, the purpose of the opening is showing this is the, it's similar sort of, you know, southern gothic world that, we're, that it's taking place in. But in this one, it's an urban fantasy world where supernatural creatures are part of everyday life to the point where, you know, they sell blood in stores. Okay, thank you, Tyler. Um, I think yeah. uh, we are going to um, move to student submissions. Um, so I can take a look at an exposition scene. Um, you should have something in particular if you want me to focus on that and look at that before anything else. Um, then uh, that would be helpful. Um, okay, let me start. It looks like I'll try to start with Michelle if she's here.
assuming she has time, I've invited her to speak. Hey, I finally was able to do that. Yay. All right. Um, so do you have time well, to, or do you have to go or do you yeah. have time to do yours? No, I, I have time now. Um, okay. I, um, um, think actually my timetable has changed a little bit. Um, so anyway, um, um, so these are like a, just right there. They're different scenes um, of, of exposition in um, one chapter. And um, I just wanted you to, you know, read over them and tell me what you think. You know, um, am I doing it the right way? Is it clunky? Is it too much? Is it too, you know, is it, you know, just tell me, t tell me what you think. Okay, sure. And what you All right. And we'll be looking specifically at conveying information. Oh, me, yeah. In exposition uh, let, is what we're Let me doing. give you just a tiny bit of backstory. So, okay. um, Shelly is with her band, um, and they're going to, they're making, they've recorded part of the video. Now they're going to go record in her father's Japanese garden. And um, he's got a Japanese garden here in, you know, in, 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 in Houston, um, where this is where this takes place. And, um, and the band members think, oh, yeah, that's really cool. You know, let's go record in your dad's, you know, um, Japanese garden. And um, so they're doing stuff for the camera. And, um so, and then they do that for, and at, at the pool too. And then, you know, so anyway, I just wanted to give you that little bit of backstory. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you for that. Um, I'll just read the first um, scene. For, okay. So Shelly and the rest of the band walked over to her dad's garden. His house was directly behind her mom's. They, I think this is supposed to say they exited from her mom's garden and walked directly into her dad's garden. Her dad's garden was divided into two parts, a beautiful Japanese garden with beautiful cherry trees, or sakura in Japanese, her first name. There were beautiful rose bushes, a lotus plants, a wisteria tree, and a peach tree. Her sisters, like her, all had floral first names, but in Japanese. I feel like we've gotten distracted from something that we didn't answer here. Uh, her dad's garden was divided into two parts, a beautiful Japanese garden with cherry trees, then you tell us about her name. Yeah. What about the other part? What's the other part? Well, right. And I, I do explain it, but I should have explained it there. I should have said, and an American style garden. Oh, okay. And if you make us I wait do explain too long. it later. Oh, okay. Understood. Um, and the reason I, I, I just wanted to put in there is just, I guess some, po I guess not poetic, but just some prose in there. That, that, you know, the reason that it's decorated this way is because, um, all uh, she and her sisters have their they have first names their floral names in Japanese and so her dad you know planted all this stuff in his garden as a symbol of uh, she and her sisters but you know that's why I was just you know I'm trying to show how pretty the garden is and why these things are each there okay understood so her dad's garden was divided into two parts a beautiful Japanese garden with cherry trees and an American garden on the other side. It would probably be how we would separate that thought. Yeah. And then maybe we'd break into a new paragraph, because each paragraph should sort of be like one thought, with each of the sentences used to advance and support that thought. And then when you, when you get to a, a brand new thought, you should indent down to a new paragraph, most of the time. Okay, so there were beautiful rose bushes, lotus plants, a wisteria tree, and a peach tree. Her sisters, like her, all had floral first names, but in Japanese. Each of the trees, bushes, or other floral plant represented she and her sisters, represented her and her sisters. The rose oh, yeah, bushes sorry. represented her eldest sister, Bana. The wisteria trees represented her sister, Fuji, born after Bana. The lotus flowers in the pond represented her sister, Hasu, third eldest. And the peach tree represented her sister, Momo, the fourth eldest. I think we call the fourth eldest the youngest normally, wouldn't we? No, no, because Shelly, Shelly's the fifth, Shelly's the youngest. Oh, she's the youngest, okay. Mm -hmm. There was a small pebble garden or zen garden, pebble garden or zen garden? Why or? Oh, a pebble garden or zen garden, because most people don't know that a zen garden is often pebbles. I think people know, I could be wrong. Um, oh, okay. Well, I, then think, I, I would think that people garden. would get it, but yeah, maybe, maybe I'm crazy. Anyway, so yeah, there's a small zen garden. With rocks, a bridge, a stone lantern, bamboo trees, a koi pond, and then in the American garden side there was a pool with lots of other foliage and a grassy area for playing sports. Her father had bought both lots. The second lot didn't have a house. He put up a fence 
and now he had a very large backyard. The second lot didn't have a house. He put up a fence, and now he oh, had... Oh, I see. It didn't have a house on it. He put up a fence, and now he had a very large backyard. So, in other words, he's got two full... He's got two lots, you know, his backyard for his house he has, but then he's got this other full lot that he's just turned into another part of the garden. Okay. Um, is this the end of the scene, or does it... is? Is the next part a new scene, or how does this work? Yeah, yeah, this is another scene. So that's, that's scene. the. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's start with the just the first one, just the description of these gardens. Okay, um, so I think that um, you can be um, in in terms of exposition in in novels. A lot of the time, we like to have a lot of sensory details to be. I mean, just in terms of just basic description, a lot of sensory details on beyond just. A, it, this feels a little bit more like a list of things that is there, rather than yeah. a character's specific memories and sensations tied to that place. I think we may have talked touched on this a, a little bit before in in some of the other yeah. descriptions, but like your character has a history with this place, I imagine, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Right. So we can be using that. We can like be sort of conveying her using her opinion of it like kind of communicating what her opinion of this place is a little bit more does she hate being here does she love being here is this a place of comfort and rest for her does this place stress her out and you can be kind of filtering the description appropriately so you can like describe things in such a way that it feels like it's from her point of view we're not just like giving a catalog listing of all the stuff that is in the space we're saying like you know that as the character walked in she smelled the familiar scent of the wisteria trees which always made her think of this Or as she sat down, you know, she ran her hands over the rough and splintery wood of the bench that she always used to get splinters on as a kid. You see how we can kind of, like, intersperse Mm -hmm. that character perspective through this and kind of filter it through your character's voice and the lens of her perception a little more? Okay, yeah. Um, um, Okay, Um, yeah, that would... Yeah, okay. Um, Well, then, the rest of it's probably going to be a little bit more like that, too, but if you don't mind reading it and give me some more, you know... Um, some advice. Sure, I can go to this next. Is this a scene here? This. Uh, yeah, it's paragraph? a different scene. It's all in the same. This is all from the same chapter, but this is a different scene. So oh. in this one, they're they're um they're recording part of their video um that's in the that's um at the pool. And they decided it'd be really cool to lay on the sun loungers and you know and all have sunglasses on and you know and flip through the magazines as the camera rolls by. Okay, great. The camera rolled toward them, towards them while holding their magazines, and each of them turned to the camera and lowered their glasses. After this, they looked at the footage. This simple action required many, many takes. I think the... Which action? The action of uh, look, turning to the camera and just the look that they gave the camera? Is that what you mean? Well, I guess I, I, guess I should say the simple act of filming required many many takes okay yeah i see what you mean next they found themselves laying on the sun loungers they didn't take as many takes next they filmed themselves diving from their sides diving from their sides you mean the sides into the deep end of the pool this too took many attempts at filming they had to set the filming on automatic finally they had a good shot Okay, so I guess I'm just looking a little bit more for a character's experience of these things. I mean, whose point of view are we yeah. in would be the first question, which I think is the answer to the same character as before. What's her name? Shelley? Okay, um, I guess I was thinking of this as, like, from the band's point of view, but I guess not mixing point of views would be better. Yeah, we typically don't want to mix point of views in the same chapter. Is this the same chapter? Yeah, it's all the same chapter. It's just that... This is a different scene. They've gone from, you know, from being in the in the garden and doing, you know, all the things that they're, you know, that they're uh, doing in the garden, and um, and you know now they're over at her um, at her mom's um, at her mom's garden next door, and they're at the pool, and you know, so they're they're playing on the sun loungers, et cetera, and they're getting the the camera on 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 automatic rollers to film them etc okay so i mean there's not a ton to talk about in terms of exposition here just because it doesn't seem like there's a lot of kind of really valuable information being conveyed in in terms of just writing on the page i guess i would just ask what is the emotion here are they having fun are they bored like what are we what are we feeling here 
Oh yeah. Okay. So I would say that they, um, that they're having fun that, you know, that, that they're having um, fun filming, um, you know, their first video together. Cause they, you know, they just formed together as a band. Although one member already left, you know, <laughs> the first day of filming, he got pissed off anyway. So, you know, they're having fun and um, filming this, even though it's taking a lot of takes and, you know, Okay. And then there's, then yeah. there's that like next one where they're they're gonna film um, the the um, the sound quality in the bathroom so they have amplification. Okay, um, we'll finish with that scene now. Okay. So, um, but yeah, my main note here is just uh, we should pretty much all, like if we're in a character's head, then we should be feeling the emotion of these moments. Um, and here I didn't okay. really get the sense that they're having any fun. It just sort of feels very factual. They looked at the footage. They took many takes. Then they filmed themselves doing this. Then they did this. Then they did this. It, we're not... What, what, are, they, are they laughing? Are they, are they, like, being goofy? Are they joking around? Like, I think we just want to see a little more of that emotion and feel like this is being perceived by a character and communicated to us through the lens of that character's perception. Well, what, one thing that I do, I do tend to write um, whenever Shelly is with her best friend, Lynn, is that the two giggle all the time. Um, okay. And um, Shelly's always doing something that makes her giggle, and then they both giggle and vice versa. And so whenever they're, they, they're together, they, they giggle, you know, a lot. And they giggle together at the same time, usually. Um, and so I, I, but that um i guess i should show more about you know how they were having fun you know um filming all the stuff and yeah, you know be specific. And... Be, i mean like if people are really serious in a series of photo shoots they're gonna have a totally different energy than if they do one with the bunny ears they do one upside down they do one jumping you know what i mean like if, if people have very different moods when they were doing or might have very different moods as they're carrying out these actions and and being in the scene so I think just by being specific, you can communicate that tone a little better. Okay. All right, we'll do this last scene, and then we'll move on. We have, I think, two more in the chat, at least so far. Shelly and the band finished eating the delicious pizza and brownies and got dressed again. They set up in her bath in the her bathroom. They brought oh, yeah. the recording and filming equipment into her bathroom. Xavier sat on the toilet instead of his stool with his drums in front of him. Brian stood on top of the counter with his mic next to him. Lynn sat in the bathtub on Xavier's stool with a keyboard in front of the tub, and Shelly stood next to her keyboard, and they shared a mic. They warmed up again. They sounded great in the bathroom. They all smiled. Once again, she began playing slowing and semi-piano. Oh, okay. Uh, slowly. Slowly. Uh, okay. Slowly or, or semi-piano, which means semi-softly. Okay. Which means semi-softly, and Xavier played his drums semi-piano. After a few measures, Lynn came in on both keyboards and Brian began playing the bass line. When they came to the chorus, the drums exploded hard, as did Shelly on lead guitar, Brian on bass, and Lynn on keyboard, and they all sang the chorus together. The, sec oops. the second verse through was harder driving than the first verse. The same intensity continued throughout, then the bridge modulated its key up, and the drumming turned to cymbals instead of the typical rock drumming. Okay. So, that, that's so far what I've got there. Um, I guess maybe when I talk, you know, they, they did all smile, you know, but mm -hmm. I wonder how do I show that they're, that they're really enjoying, you know, what they're playing, you know, should I say, I, you know, they're, they're, they're smiling, they're playing with like full gusto or whatever, or however, you know. Uh, well, um, we're, I guess we're drifting a little bit away from exposition again, but I can just answer the... Sure, we can get into that um, just if you want. I think that the main way to do that is by placing this scene and all your scenes in a character's point of view. And then we're going to want to sort of experience the music as your character does, which would... Again, this feels a little bit just kind of clinical and factual. He played the drums. That guy played the guitar. This guy played this drum. That guy played that instrument. Whereas I feel like we want to feel the emotion of the character that we are in her, the head of. So, for instance, does she get totally lost in the music? Is she drifting away and imagining that she's in outer space? Or is she, you know, like what many different performers go into the zone in different ways, don't they? Or they might, um, they, it looks different for everybody. So we kind of want to see what is the perception of your main character who's in this scene. Is all she can focus on how everyone's messing up? Is she like really uh, nitpicky? 
and really sort of, you know, how some people are kind of control freaks. And if that's the case, maybe you write the scene and all she all she writes is or all that her the narration says is something like, you know, Brian messed up the note on the third song. Jackson messed up the drum beat on the fifth song. Like maybe all she notices are when people make a mistake. Or maybe all she does the opposite and she only notices when people are doing awesome, you know. Jackson only had a small part in the symbols in that one song, but he killed it. And, you know, maybe, so just look at, like, how does a, a one single character, your, your lead point of view character, experience this? What does she focus on and notice? And how are those affecting her, those things affecting her emotionally? And I think that's just a more dynamic way to write almost every scene is by making sure that we have very squarely placed this in character POV. Well, um, okay, I, I really appreciate that. So I think what I'll do is, like, I... Uh, you know, it, me writing um, this, I when I put uh, Xavier um, on the um, on the toilet, I I was laughing to myself, and I thought, okay, well maybe maybe she and and um, and her best friend maybe they'll start giggling then, you know, and then they have to you know say, okay, okay, let's be serious now, and you know, but I imagine that what she what she would be feeling is that even you know this is her first. Um, Re, um, recording for um for a song that she wrote and that she's that she's really excited so maybe she's got like butterflies in her stomach um, there you go yeah I, you know i i know for me when i get excited when, when i'm about to perform my throat closes up and i have to take like a a big breath and go oh, there you, you know, go yeah that'd be um, that'd be a great detail for a book stuff stuff that you couldn't even see in a movie right if it's stuff that is happening physiologically or mentally with your characters, then those are all great tools to use in a book for sure. And I think yeah, you mentioned so also, what if we're, what if one character looks kind of dumb in his photo or, or we start laughing at him? We can, a little conflict might also be able to um, uh, oh, okay. jazz up a scene that feels like it's, it might be boring or it might not be working. Even if it's a small conflict, they can make scenes more interesting. Well, like, you know, the Brian character jumps up on, on, um, on her cabinet in her bathroom and, um, you know, in the, in, uh, in her, um, bathroom, you know, I haven't written it out, but you know, in her bathroom, she's got like perfume and things like that. And so she could tell him, you know, Hey, don't, don't break anything, you know? And then they, and then he can say, Oh, you know, like, don't worry, I won't break any of your precious stuff, you know, but although the Brian character is like really nice and helpful, you know, and it was the, the, the character who was difficult to get along with, I wrote him out, you know, by, gotcha. by him being difficult, you know. It's not, it's not that I didn't want a difficult person as conflict. It's not that I just felt like the conflict I've written was like, you know, okay, this character will not work in this band. So let's, you know, let's make him to have too much conflict. And he decides that he's going to leave. And everybody else is like, okay, bye, you know. Gotcha, um, I see. So yeah, conflict is another just a great tool to make either exposition go down a little smoother or to just kind of spice up or, you know, spruce up any scene that feels like it's not really working. We do have two others to, to get to, so I want to thank you again okay, for no sharing problem. this. And, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Hope that was helpful. Yeah. All right, so let's look at Cinnamon, five pages of exposition. Maybe you can read out, you have some context for us. Oh, can you hear me? I hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. So what I wrote in the, well, where did I put it? Um, yeah. So I wrote, uh, the context is that Magdalena has just found out earlier in the day that Finian has just died. And also that we've seen Magdalena's magic used in one previous scene. And they said she can feel and see the source of an injury. That's her magic. Okay. Great. So, is, this is a fantasy script. Yes, fantasy and horror. I've been writing it to script so often. I'm working on making it better. Great. Okay. So it looks like you have the first part crossed out. So I'll start at the bottom here. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, maybe. Okay. So uh, Magdalena is sitting on a chair, still just staring. A knock on the door. She picks herself up and opens it. Opens the door. Okay. It's sister. Is it Lisa? Please. Lisa, okay. Or Lisa. You can say whatever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. She says, hi, I came to pick up the cell for Sister Lingy. 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 Okay. <laughs> and the seaweed for the kitchen stores. 
Oh yes, come in, I still need to finish the salve, actually, and I'll get the seaweed tomorrow. Sorry, my mind's been elsewhere. Prince Finian. Yes. Do you want to talk about it? I'd love to know if you want to talk. Sorry, my mind's elsewhere. Oh, her mind is on Prince Finian. I see. Okay. Yeah. So, do you want to talk about it? I'd love to know. Later, Magdalena crushes herbs with her mortar and pestle and adds them to a steaming pot on the stove. She says, I learned to cook from my parents. They started getting orders from the palace. My mother was in charge of a dinner there one day. Who's she talking to? Uh, still Sister Elise. So she's in the room. Uh, so I should put her again there. Yeah, what is she doing, I guess, would be my question in that moment. Listening, standing listen. there. Okay. I'll just put Sister Elise stands next to her. Okay. Um, Thanks. So, she's, I learned to cook from my parents. Parents, and this has to do with the any like I'm just looking for what, how are we transitioning from this topic to the how did she learn to cook? She's on. She's cooking. I mean, it's going to transition in the dialogue, but she's standing at the stove. So I figured she's standing at the stove making the salve that Sister Lee's asked for. So, and so now they're going to talk about the prince. Yeah. Okay, I'll just keep reading. Um, okay. So, interior palace, kitchen. All right, so seven-year-old Magdalena is alone in a, in a cozy kitchen. With oh, yeah, it should butter, be in. Stirring pink pie, filling a pot. Stirring pink pie, filling a pot. What does that mean? It's pie filling. It should be pie filling in a pot, I in, think. In a pot, okay. Yeah. A boy comes in and looks in the pot. It's seven-year-old Finian. He says, what are you doing? I have to stir this so it cooks right. What is it? Filling from Lincolnberry Pie. I love Lincolnberry Pie. Me too. It's my favorite. What's your name? Fin Finian, what's your name? Magdalena, do you want to be friends? Okay. They just smile at each other. And that was that. Uh, that was a flashback to... I learned to cook from my parents. They started getting orders from the palace. My mother was in charge of a dinner there one day. But then she's alone in the kitchen. Well, my mother was in charge of a dinner one day. Why is her mother not in the scene then? She's helping her mom who's doing something else, but I can explain that if that needs to be explained. Oh, okay. So, my mother was in charge of a dinner one, there one day, and I was helping, is is what she meant. So, this is a sure. was one time I'll that I was helping. Sure, I'll add that in. Okay. One time that I was helping cook at the castle. All right, later, seven year old Magdalena and Finian sit on the counter eating Lincolnberry pie. He always come down for snacks or use the kitchen to hide from his tutors. He wasn't a very good student, I'm afraid. Now he's ten, escaping his tutor, creeps, escaping his tutor, creeps into the kitchen with his finger over his lips, like shush. Ten-year-old Magdalena is kneading dough. She looks up and back down to her dough. He comes up behind her and steals a little. Uh, she objects. He says, "Finders keepers." She yells at him. Ten-year-old Magdalena chases him, brandishing a dish towel, and they laugh. Okay, another day. They sit at the counter talking. She said, "We'd get to talking." She pulls over a basket of muffins and they start eating. Okay. Um, they sit on the counter eating noodles. These are your best yet. You always say that. Magdalena adds ingredients to her steaming pot and stirs. Okay. So I didn't have many friends. I never told him, but he was my best friend. We grew apart as we got older. What happened? We moved to the capital's palace. It was crowded there. Okay. It's a sunny day and the gardens are crowded with poised, exquisitely dressed guests, including many young ladies. His parents wanted him to pick out his future wife. They kept bringing in all these great ladies. Finn still tried to include me, but I couldn't fit in. 15-year-old Finian's taking, talking charmingly with several ladies and beckons 15-year-old Magdalena over. She goes awkwardly, stuffing a pastry in her face. He was always busy. Wait, isn't she a servant? Mm, she's just helping in the kitchen. She's not employed by the palace. But wasn't her mom? Well, they were getting orders from the palace, but they're, like, they're having their own cooking. You know, like, they cook for their own they're like catering basically oh catering okay um, i mean it's not catering but you know what i mean it's catering okay sure but i maybe i need to specify that somehow uh well i mean i would assume that somebody making food in the kitchen of a castle is a servant there just because that's how but this is a fantasy world so maybe like it could be different i'm not how far into the script even is this page it says what page like nine ten Oh, these are the pa okay. Eleven. So, so we're. But those, that's not the catering situation is not getting explained later. So <laughs> okay. it's gonna get explained. It better be now. <laughs> okay. Um. So yeah. let, let me just read to the end. I think I have one 
Okay. Two pages left. Okay. So, uh, where was I? Here we go. So, Magdalena added ingredients to her pot. Right. I didn't have many friends. He was my best friend. We moved to the palace. It was... We moved to the capital's palace. It was crowded there. Okay. It's a sunny day, and the gardens are crowded with poisons, exquisitely dressed guests. Her pen. Okay, that's right. I already read this part. Um, so, she goes over to him. He talks to her. He was always busy. He never did pick a wife. Back to the present. He never did pick a wife. I feel like we need some kind of visual there of him sending them away or them leaving disappointed or something. I, th I think you just need some kind of image that shows he never picked wife. Um, hmm. just something that we How see. do you show a visual of not doing something? I guess I see what you mean. Yeah, like we watch... <laughs> I feel like it's like they, over time. Yeah, they storm okay. off in a huff. I don't know what, like, exactly specifically what, sure. what, what happened there. He, she watches them go... <laughs> Um, okay, so eventually my curse hit me and ruined my life. I couldn't live in the city anymore. Fifteen-year-old Magdalena stands in the bustling marketplace, overwhelmed with sensation and the effects of her vision. You don't realize how many injuries people get until you're seeing them and feeling them all at once. A bruiser walks by her, pummeling and broken glass in a bar fight. Pain. Broken glass. Okay, so these are just like really kind of almost abstract, quick shots that we just, yeah. okay, just see super close up. Oh, this is like, um, what's it called? Unbreakable, or, uh, the dead zone. Okay. A kid runs by, 15-year-old Magdalena with skin knees. He trips and falls on a rock. The hard of seeing man bumps into her, the man's accident in a factory with accident staring in the eyes. Okay, I like how you've, I like how you've done this kind of quick series of shots and quick flashes. The injuries are reflected on her body. What does that mean? That's her curse. That she feels, and, like, when people get hurt around her, she can feel it, and it's reflected on her. What does that mean? It's reflected on her. Like, so if someone got, if someone had like a bruise, and it, and they were in pain from it, you would see that on her. Or like, if someone, like, you know, got a cut on their arm, you would see the same cut on her. Or if someone got burnt. So we see, we see her eyes get scalded by acid. Well, you would just see the effects of it. So you wouldn't see, like, acid splash into her eyes, but, like, if, like, their skin got dissolved a little bit, then you would see that on her. Okay, because it's just, it's not very specific in the wording. I just can't tell what this specifically means uh, in this line. I think you're going to need to just tell us what exactly okay. is happening there. Um, sure. And, and I think also, it's... Go ahead. I was going to say it's also in one spot previously in the script, but I'll describe it more specifically. Is there any specific way you think I should describe it, or I'll just work on it later, if not? Well, is this all happening at once, or are these a bunch of separate instances? Um, there's, she's like in the bustling town, and all these people are walking by her with those issues. So she's seeing a flash to how they got the injury, but then in the present, all of she just feels it. It's so like she can, she has sort of a vision of how they got the injury, but they're not getting the injury at that minute. But she is. Yes, so more or less. Like of, she's uh, feeling it, and you can see it on her skin, but it's not like she's actually getting acid splash in her face. But it feels like it. Yeah. Okay, so I think we need to see her react to one of these things at a time. If you just show all these painful things happening at once, then if you show, I guess you, are you just, we can't show all these things happen, happen to her at the same time. She can't get acid in the eyes. She can't right. trip and fall and get broken glass and, and, and all these things all at once. So I think you need to maybe just show quick flashes. I guess my point, Go ahead. my point here in this exposition is that it's just really, really overwhelming, and that's why she had to move away. Like, there was a previous scene where there was just one person with an injury, and it happens, and then you see that person's injury on her, and she sort of talks about it. Mm -hmm. But here, I sort of wanted to show just why she's moving. Like, why okay. she can't live in a city. Okay. But maybe it's not. Maybe I need to change how it's done. I think it's mostly working. I just was having trouble understanding the fact that each of these injuries was manifesting on her the moment that she gets it. Um, and then, I guess if you're saying this is just sort of the last one in the sequence, then as we end this series of flashes, is this her getting the acid in the eyes and falling, like, sagging against the wall? This is, like, the worst one yet, I guess. It's, um, like, all of... Like, all of the injuries can be seen on her, so she's just, like, passing out. Damn, okay, so she's, like, messed up at this point. Right, yeah. Yeah, I, I would just be really specific with what's, what's yeah, happening there. Yeah, more stuff to see. Yeah. <laughs> okay, 
Okay, back to the present. I found this school in the middle of nowhere where people live quiet lives and rarely get hurt. I thought in such a holy place maybe my thirst would be cured, but no. She focuses on the liquid in the pot. I never saw Finn again. He probably forgot about me. But I always thought someday, how can a person just be gone? She's crying now. Sister Lee's might be about to cry too. She says, I'm so sorry. We go to the bedroom. The and then that's just the next morning. Okay, go. So, stop, stop there? Yeah, you can stop there. Okay. Um, my question is, why did we stop with the flashback as soon as she starts explaining about a school she went to in the middle of nowhere? That's the school they're in now. That's the school they're in now. Oh, okay. So when she is saying, I found this school, this place that we're both in, they both know this already, and she's just sort of yeah. explaining why she's here specifically? Okay. Yeah. Where people live quiet lives and rarely get hurt. I thought in such a holy place, maybe my curse would be cured, but no. Okay. Got it. What were the specific questions you had going into this? Remind, can you remind me? I didn't ask any. <laughs> you didn't ask any. That's okay. You just want sort of no. a, a general assessment. Yeah, uh, because especially sure. like because I know it's I know it's an like an exposition dump. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like here's the history of these people's relationship. Um, yeah. So I think that uh, this method of having a character start to explain and then we flash back, it can work fine. I think that it just has to then feel really essential. Like every scene that we flash back to needs to feel really essential because it is sort of taking away from the main timeline of your story to go back in. Yeah. So if you, I would maybe suggest cutting back on this a little bit or maybe kind of just getting a little quicker to the point in some of these moments. Like, especially this one where the whole scene is just, they're like, hi, what's your name? It's this. Hi, what's your name? It's this. What are you doing? This. Oh, okay. Now we're friends. Okay, cool. And I realize maybe that's sort of the point. It was what you're trying to say, that it was very yeah. kind of effortless for them to become friends. Yeah. Um, but maybe there's a slightly more uh, to the point way we can do that or way that we can do that that doesn't, um, that just is a little more entertaining. Like, I feel like if, if it isn't an entertaining moment, we don't need to see as much of it. Um, and maybe we mm -hmm. can just get the idea from one single shot where they're like, hey, what are you doing? Coloring. Okay. Now we're friends. Like, do we need... Mm -hmm. As much, I would wonder. Um, and, and just whatever you can do to maybe cut back a little bit on it. Um, I think you've done the voiceover well. Um, he used to hide from his tutors. You've given us a little bit that we couldn't necessarily see from just watching. So it is worth having her chime in now and again to clarify. Um, I think that especially when we're having him seeming to continue a romance with her over more qualified candidates, then maybe we'd want to... Uh, convey if that's a big problem or not. Like, wh where is the moment where he sort of calls her over and sends everyone else away? He is talking charmingly with several ladies. Then he beckons her over. How do they react to that? How does she react to that? Is that a problem? Is that causing gossip? Is that, like, the fact that he's maintaining this relationship with her, I'd sort of just want to know, is it a controversy? Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> I would think that that would be what you were trying to convey in this relationship is not only how they got to know each other and the fact that they're friends, but what it means for both of them. Is that right? Yeah. Or they, at least for her. Right. Because they come from separate worlds, don't they? Yeah. Okay. So if that's going to be the case, I think we're going to want to see a little of that conflict or divide. That feels like it's already there. It's just not sort of being brought to the surface and clarified enough for us. So we want to know, is this going to like um, be a problem? For, like, is this a problem for them? Is the fact that she's a poor baker and he's a rich prince is that gonna like cause conflict or i think we just want to know how people feel about that and are reacting and responding to that in the moment okay yeah i wondered like maybe that's a question when when do you put that kind of thing in at the beginning and when do you like reveal it gradually because like obviously then she later she can talk to other people and they'll be like i can't believe you yeah we're hanging out you know like so how like a little when goes do you decide a, a little goes a long okay. way especially in like period piece costume drama stuff where like even people even the touch of a hand or even like a whispered conversation can be really important plot moments um yeah so maybe just a shot or two of reactions now and again like we see People are starting to think less of her over time as we just see, you know, they start to, start to exclude her from conversations or they start to, um, I don't know, they shut a door in her face or just those little moments I think will really convey what's going on with the dynamic. Yeah, okay, thanks. All right, thanks so much for sharing this. I realize I just read it and gave a bunch of kind of scattered um, feedback on it, but hopefully that um, is helpful. And I think the sequence is largely working. It feels just a little long-winded to me. So I'd maybe see if you can cut half, half to a full page from it, and I think you'll be in good shape. Okay, yeah, that is helpful. Thanks very much. Sure, thank you so much for sharing. All right, looks like we have one 
more. Do we have one more from Jay? A question from Jay, it looks like. Did I skip it? Oh, wait. We also have uh, Samurai, which is posted by... Is it just H? Is that the whole name? Or is it cut off somehow? Okay. Um, let me check how long Samurai is. If it's pretty short, I can do both. Uh, looking... Oh, it's only, two, it's only a page, a little bit of page. Okay, I'll do both. We'll start with Samurai. So, come on up, H. Are you able to... There you are. Your mic's on mute still. There you are. Hello, hello. Hey, I can hear you. What's up, Con? Hey, so, is this from a movie or a show or anything you want to tell us about this before we read through it? Um, it, it would be from a show. Uh, pretty much what I'm trying to do here is show exposition um, from two stories at the same time, one visually and one verbally. Okay. Um, so what happened before this pretty much is about two spies who get uh, found out uh, by two other spies that are chasing after them. Um, the two spies that we're focusing here on dialogue, uh, Mudo and Sordo, they uh, they kind of fuck up trying to get uh, Zoe, trying to capture her, and um, pretty much Sor uh, Sordo got stabbed. Um, Mudo got stabbed. Sordo gets jumped by a bunch of YouTube uh, YouTubers after he tries to see uh, steal Zoe's uh, Zoe's phone, and pretty much this is the after effect. So what I'm trying to do again, trying to show two stories, expositions. One visually, that would be Ben and Zoe, and then just one uh, off-dialogue voiceover uh, uh, um, uh, verbally. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, so let's read through. Interior shack later, Ben and Zoe open up the trombone cases. Inside are tactical knives, a medikit, handcuffs, burner phones, skincare products, rolls of euros, and a noir novella. Zoe shoves the, re shoves the remaining snacks in her case. They exit. We hear someone moaning in pain. A door slams. I was looking for a character reaction to seeing this stuff, but I'm not sure where we are in the script or what uh, what exactly is going on here, but that's okay. So they exit. We hear someone moaning in pain. A door slams. Mudo says, where the fuck have you been? That takes us to exterior boardwalk. Continuous. Is this continuous? We went, we, they walked right from the shack out to a boardwalk? Um, I guess that would be later. Okay. Yeah. Continuous means no time at all passes. So it's like walking from the kitchen to the living room is, is continuous. Um, but if it's later, then, yeah, give us later. Zoe and Ben, with shades and beach hats on, sit in a tram car. Ben gestures a conversation with the driver. Gestures a conversation. I think you're saying he's having a conversation with the driver, but we just can't hear it. Is that right? Yeah, he's kind of like, because, uh, again, I don't want any dialogue from Zoe and Ben. So I, I, I put Ben charades a conversation with the driver, but I, I was trying to look for the right word on that one. But, yeah, pretty much you can see he's using, like, his hands to try to it just I visually I was trying to show he's having a conversation with the uh, tram car driver I see what you mean but I think the answer here is actually at the beginning of the sequence to say something like um, the audio of this conversation supersedes the following sequence so we don't like just tell us that and like give us a little note at the beginning that says like we won't hear any audio from this portion and that way we'll understand and it will also just be a more streamlined way of writing it you won't it won't lead to confusion where we're like why is he just gesturing um, you can just say, he has a loud animated conversation with the driver, and we, we already have read the rules, so we don't need to restate the fact that it's silent. Does that make sense? Kind of. Kind of? Um, so you can write a note in the script that says, the following sequence will be in black and white, R right? Or you can write any note you want. You can say, the following sequence will be, or you can say, like, start slow motion. You can say, the next sequence will be totally silent. So you, you can write that rule on the page. And then by doing that, it will just clear up confusion. Okay. Just a tip. Okay. Um, so, Zone Ben with shades and beach hats on, sitting in a tram car, he gestures the conversation, right? Okay. Sorta, what happened to your face? So, we're hearing a second conversation happening as we're watching other actions unfold. Okay. I got jumped. I had to stab a guy. How much blood have you lost? How should I know? Hurry up and stitch me up. My hands are numb. Jumped by who? An old lady behind Zoe asks if she can take a photo of her and her husband. So, snaps a photo for them. Uh, some queers white knighting for her phone. Stay still, let me check. Okay, wow, she didn't stab anything important. That's nice for her. Nice of her. She stabbed me. I mean, she could have stabbed you in the neck. That would be worse. All right, we're in a ferry terminal now. Zoe snacks on churros. She has her eyes in the entrance. 
then returns with tickets, Zo offers him a show. Sorta of says, okay, how's the 20 milligrams of morphine working on you? Good, good, never the you know, born in. I'll be gentle. <laughs> okay. Um, so, it's a quick, just one page um, here, that we have here. Um, I like what you're doing, the sort of hearing a different conversation happening while we're watching something else occur. Can be really effective, especially if it really contrasts with what we're watching, and it seems like it is. They're having a relaxing day on the beach or the boardwalk while this guy's talking about I've been stabbed. Is that the kind of contrast you're trying to intentionally draw? Yeah, again, just um, a conversation is happening, but it has nothing to do, or, or I mean, it does. Pretty much we're watching them having to figure out from the incident that just happened. But um, I kind of want Sordo, I, I like the idea of just having Sordo and Mudo, we just hear them. Right. Like, uh, like we again, we hear the door slam. I, that's another part that I found confusing. Um, uh, Zoe shows the remaining snacks into her case. They exit. We hear someone moaning in pain. A door slams. So, but I want that to just be the audio. Oh, okay. you know, um, that is usually done with a technique called prelapse. So, technique if we're about to, if if like after the sequence we cut to the scene of what is it, Mudo and Sordo, and one of them has been stabbed, then this would all have technically been prelap. Have you heard of prelap before? It's P-R-E dash L-A-P, and it's, in, in, it's an inline parenthetical after the similar yeah. voiceover here. So you could do that if you want to. I mean, you could say prelap, we hear someone moaning in pain. Um, or you could just, there might be a different, a different way to write that out, but you're trying to say that's not actually something occurring in the shack. No, yeah, exactly. Okay. So that's that's something that, by at the beginning of the sequence writing the rule the audio of this scene will supersede or will will drown out the uh the the all audio of what we're about to watch something like that just included one sentence that explains what we're about to do and then every moment where you need to do that you can say something like this moment where we hear someone moaning in pain nobody will be confused among the readers if you just clarify that at the top okay yeah i have a lot of notes in this story like i have a note like oh they speak in galician spanish or this whole scene will take place in Spanish. You can do as many uh, as Yeah, at some point, I, I, that's why I was gonna put it here, but I just, uh, I felt like I was overdoing it. But I guess I could just do the pre-lap. It, it, it would be like brackets, pre-lap, brackets, or I guess it could be um, pre-lap, um, colon. Yeah. We hear some moaning and pain. Yeah, go ahead, Col colon's fine. You can do, yeah, just pre-lap and then tell us what we hear, and we'll, we know what that means, so we, we will get that it's not actually occurring in that same space. Gotcha. So other than that, um, anything that, like, you tripped on? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, uh, yeah, I, I kind of I kinda like the contrast. One, these people are having the most chill day ever, and the other group is having uh, the worst day ever. One of them has been stabbed, so... I like the, the juxtaposition of what was happening between the two. It made sense to me that we would do it that way. No, I, yeah, no, I, I think that the way that you've done it here works well. Gotcha. All right, cool, cool. Yeah, I was, um, I had trouble with this. Just, I don't know if I was being too, uh, too. Uh, I, I just didn't know how. To, I, I feel, I feel like I didn't know how to do it. And this is the way that came to me. Yeah, just, and I felt like you, you, yeah, you've done totally fine. Just just use look up prelap and how it's used, and um, by doing that, you I think that's the technique that you're specifically using here, technically, even though it's kind of an extended version of it. Um, and just give us a little note to explain what's going on in the sequence, and you should be totally fine. Got it, got it. Also, just one question: Don't you think prelap is a bit too old school? No, I use it all the time, or I see it all the time. Got it. All right. All right, well, thanks, Khan. Just wanted to get some uh, some eyes on this specific scene. But thanks, man. I really appreciate it. Sure. Thank you so much for sharing. All right, looks like we have one more question uh, that I see in the chat. Um, I won't bring anyone else up on stage. I'll just answer this before we wrap up for today. Nacho, do you have a list of the upcoming classes and events as well that we can share? Maybe you've already shared it. There it is. Look at that. Oh, we have some great little pictures for them, too. Um, so these are the free upcoming classes. Uh, I just want to give a shout out to, we have on Saturday the 17th, that's tomorrow, uh, Magic Writing Workshop, Fantasy fa fantasy Action Scenes. That's going to be tomorrow at noon, noon to two. Then Sunday the 18th, we have another magical class about creature magical creatures and monsters. That's going to be Sunday the 18th, 10 to noon. 
And then there's a bunch more free classes coming up. They're going to be Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays throughout the end of July. We have new boot camps also starting up soon. If you want to go from idea to finish draft of a brand new feature film, then you can come to session one, the overview session of our feature boot camp, Friday, June 30th at 6 p.m. You'll learn how to write a movie in eight weeks. Then week one of that same class is going to be later, and that is starting on Friday, July 7th. So running Fridays from 6 to 8, we'll have feature boot camp. And then TV boot camp, that's starting Sunday, July 9th, 10 to noon on Sundays. You're going to write a whole pilot in six weeks. New novel boot camp, July 22nd. You'll write a novel in 90 days. So that's going to be 12 class meetings over in our WordCamp server. A couple other classes there for you to check out. So look in the chat if you'd like to see. And you can click the interested button to be notified before any of them begin. I'm going to take one last question, then we'll wrap up. So Jay says that I'm um, working on the outline for a script. I don't have a script, but hope this is okay. The main character was born into the farm business, which radically changed when he was 12 to 13, where due to the weather and lack of space, all farms switched to indoor farms, where it's somewhat automated. I'm writing a scene where in the present, the main character, an astronaut, walks into his parents' indoor farm, but within the next few scenes, he'd be in space, and I'm struggling to connect the scenes. I need to show the change of farms and how it makes him feel, but at the same time, I'm not sure if it's necessary. Hmm. Okay, you're writing a, you are struggling to connect the scenes where the main character is investigating his parents' farm and also where he is in space. You're wondering how to transition between those moments, perhaps? Um, I mean, there's lots of nice little ways to transition where something reminds the character of something happening somewhere else. A sensory detail can cause a sort of flashback if they smell, hear music. I mean, think of the opening scene in The Green Mile where Paul is in the nursing home and he sees an old movie that was playing. That reminds him of a movie he saw in the past, which sort of is connected to that story. So there's lots of ways that we can transition just based on your character's point of view. Like, think of things that would actually cause them to remember something or to think about something else. And we can use those either sensory triggers or cues in order to transition from one space to the next. Um, I want to make sure I understood the, the question fully, though. Let me make sure that I'm getting it. So he's an astronaut. He goes into the indoor farm, but within the next few scenes, he'd be in space. So we're sort of moving ahead in time, it sounds like. I hope that's right. Feel free to comment if that's not correct, Jay. Um, but so lots of things can, I mean, connect those moments. You're struggling how to connect them. So yeah, think of maybe like what is something that can uh, transition us naturally from one scene to the next. I'd have to, I'd have to look at the scene to be sure, but um, you will have a character talking about, um, maybe think of, I mean, the tone of the script matters a lot here. If it's supposed to be a funny moment, your character could end the scene on, you know, I'm going to be a farmer for the rest of my life. Smash cut to him in space might get the audience to laugh for a second and create that sort of intended emotional effect for your story. If it's not that, if it's, that's not the target emotion you're going for, there might be other sort of ways that you can do this. You might be able to surprise us with the transition or you might be able to make it feel very gradual if you wanted to like um make do like a sort of a long fade or time lapse where we watch the garden grow and grow and grow over time until finally it di disintegrates and falls into ruin that might be a way that we can transition from now into the future we might tilt up and pan up to the sky and see the spaceship floating by something like that um i'm not sure exactly how much more specific i can get without seeing the, the scene itself but those are just like a couple thoughts and ideas i had looking at that um, you're trying to show the change of the farms and how it makes him feel. So, yeah, I think we we'll want to see him reacting to stuff in the farm or, you know, he can comment on something, he can touch something, pick something up. Maybe it's even, if he hasn't been there in a long time, maybe his facial recognition no longer works. There's all kinds of ways that we can show how he feels about this place and what his role in this place is. And then I would just find some emotional or idea transition that we can do. You know, we, we cut ahead to juxtapose to where your character is now. Um, we might, you know, the, me the method I just mentioned where you say something like, I'm never going to do X, and then we show your character immediately doing X, that can work. Or maybe it's something else that, like, we might want your character to set the promise of, you know, one of these days I'm going to be in one of those spaceships, and then if we just fade from the farm to space, we're going to get that, okay, this is probably the same character. Or we, we, we might fade from his face to his face later on. We do this all the time. We see this all the time in, in, in movies, too, where it's like we start on a kid, we fade to them as an adult, and we get, oh, that's the same person. So you might think of what can you simply cut between or fade between or transition between to show the connection between these two things. It might be like he picks up a toy spaceship, holds it in the air, and then we, you know, I think 2001 does something sort of similar to this, doesn't it? Okay, um, so I'm not able to answer that one too much more specifically. I'm just not having it in front of me, but hope that gives you just some ideas and how you can move between these moments. 
it sounds like it's working well in your script, and I would just um, feel free to share more in the upcoming uh, classes, workshops, or labs if that is not enough. Um, hope that was useful to you guys. Hope that you enjoyed this class on exposition with us. Um, we have a bunch of stuff coming up, so definitely stay tuned. Check the events tab on Script Camp. Just scroll to the very top of the Discord window and click on 70, it says 72 events. You'll see everything coming out soon, and you can mark anything that you're interested in and will be notified about. All right, um, that's going to wrap us up for now. Um, thank you guys for coming, and we'll see you. We have a class tomorrow. That class on magic in combat is going to be tomorrow at noon to 2 on our WordCamp server, but there should be an announcement for it here as well. Thank you guys. Um, we will see you soon at your next Script Camp class or event.